Ladies and gentlemen, once more, may I ask you to be seated. Excuse me. Good morning. It's a very misty and grey Brussels morning, yet I'm happy to open this conference. I'm Anna Fotyga, Polish member of uh, the European Parliament, and together with my colleagues Kosma Złotowski uh, Robert of Poland, Robert Ziele of Latvia, and uh, Alexander Sasha von Drav of uh, uh, Czechia, we have the pleasure to welcome you to uh, this uh, conference hosted by the ECR uh, Group of the European uh, Parliament. Uh, I welcome. Uh, the chair of conferences, forums of uh, uh, free nations of post-Russia, Oleg uh, Megaletsky and his uh, co-workers, as well as all distinguished uh, panelists will introduce them one by one. Uh, before their contri contributions. Uh, the title of this fifth edition of, of the uh, conference is uh, about Imperial Russia, conquest, uh, genocide, uh, and uh, uh, colonization. Uh, and uh, of course, everything happens in the context of uh, the war of aggression waged by Russian Federation on Ukraine in 2014 and then uh, escalating uh, so uh, in such violent, bloody and, and criminal way actually uh, on uh, February 24th. All of us stand by Ukraine, we, we do our utmost in order to, to help Ukraine win this war and uh, push uh, the invader out of the uh, territory as internationally recognized, I, I, I simply stated, including uh, Crimea, of course. And uh, here in the European Parliament, uh, with the absolute vast majority of uh, MEPs, we support Ukraine in every document, in every resolution taken, despite uh, uh, recent uh, events for many years already, we are uh, very resolute and decided. Our time is limited and we have uh, many outstanding speakers, panelists, representing uh, both uh, US, Western Europe, my region, Central and Eastern Europe, they are representatives of, of Ukraine, but Actually, what is the most important, there are representatives of free nations uh, living within the borders, borders of Russian Federation. And we would like to discuss uh, diagnosis, problems, and uh, possible scenarios for for future future Russia. Without much ado, I would like to, to start first panel that is a broad uh, overview of, of, let's say, historic uh, uh, contest background of uh, the uh, imperial ideology, because we are going to discuss uh, uh, imperialism of, of uh, Russia and uh, ideology starting with Muscovy 
to the the Russian to 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 world uh, order to Russian mayor. We will like we will like to to discuss con conquest and exploitation, and starting with the times uh, over ages, starting. Uh, uh, with times of Ivan the Terrible and until current times, so presidency of of uh, Vladimir Putin, aggressive uh, policies, uh, uh, ending with the war on Ukraine and hopefully with defeat of current uh, uh, current uh, Russian order also af after defeating Russia in this war. I stated simply, and uh, I know that no, not all of, of uh, members of international um, experts uh, agree with me, yet I, I, I put this uh, quite openly. Uh, without much ado, because our time is limited, I would like to, to start uh, uh, the first panel that I have the, the pleasure and, and privilege of uh, moderating. And our first speaker is uh, Professor Brian uh, Williams, well-known uh, American scholar, uh, the tenure full professor of, uh, uh, at uh, University of Massachusetts Dartmouth, uh, lecturer in, of the University of London, and what is most, from my point, also contributor to, to very prestigious and diverse <coughs> media outlets, both uh, uh, within the U.S. and, and overseas. Um, but what is most important, I would like to, 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 to tell about his two books. They are very relevant for today's uh, discussions. Uh, the Crimean Tatars, and the topic is particularly dear to me. And, and uh, Chech the Chechen Inferno. Professor, uh, floor is yours. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, what I'm going to try to do today is take you through the almost inexorable advance of Russia from the small state of Rus all the way over towards Alaska, down into Kazakhstan, and of course into the Crimea. Uh, I'm going to try to do it as quickly as possible in the 10 minutes allotted to me. And I'm going to do something I think might be interesting. I'm going to compare this in some ways to America's inexorable advance into over the Appalachians and across the West. So I'll begin this journey by going back in time to the time of Alexander, well, Vigo, uh, Ivan the Terrible, Ivan Grozny. It was under Grozny that the Russians made their first transition from being a kingdom or a czardom or a state to becoming an empire by moving over the Ural Mountains and crossing into Siberia. This is very similar to the English and later the Americans crossing from the Appalachian Mountains into the lands of the Plains Indians. My journey will take us from the area in green there, uh, Russia, up in the forest, across that vast area in pink, which is the Golden Horde. Uh, we're gonna go across Siberia and down into Central Asia and down towards the Caucasus and the Crimea. So this journey begins with the first conquest, which is of the, the Tatar Khanate of Kazan uh, by Ivan Grozny. Uh, 1550s, they move into Kazan, and later into Siberia. Slight delay there. Uh, this shows it better. Uh, Kazan right there, sorry. So this is the Kazan Khanate. This is the beginning of the conquest, and we know that when the Russians moved into Kazan, there was mass conversion to Christianity, as you had with American Indians or Native Americans uh, in America. Uh, one group called the Krishans, of course, Christian Tatars. From there, they moved down into the Nogai Horde, uh, and also into um, Siberia, the Siberian Khanate. Of 
course, you all know the same famous St. Basil's Cathedral, uh, built to honor uh, this conquest of Kazan uh, under Ivan Grozny, Ivan the Terrible. Uh, this map, I think, captures the truly epic nature of Russia's inexorable conquest, uh, moving across the vast forest, the taiga uh, of Siberia, uh, eventually going to Kamchatka and crossing over into Alaska. Uh, this is a famous painting of Yermak, the Cossacks, moving through the vast forest of Siberia, clashing with the animist or Sufi Muslim peoples living in the vastness of uh, Siberia. Meanwhile, this is happening at the same time they're having these conquests in the New World by the Spanish. Uh, Cortez, Pizarro are moving across uh, Mexico, Peru, using the same technology, modern European technology, to crush the indigenous peoples, uh, the Incas or the Aztecs in the New World. Uh, here we uh, see the native people of Alaska, uh, uh, this is actually in the border of Alaska and Siberia, taken in the early 1900s. Uh, and of course, this conquest led to the collapse of many of these ancient societies. The Tuvans are, are famous for their, their Buddhist society. Their society, in many ways, fell apart under Russian conquest. We know Tuvans are being used today as cannon fodder in the war against uh, Ukraine, which is not really their war, uh, but it led to the collapse of many of their ancient traditions and culture. And this map, I think, is important in capturing the scale of Russia's conquest. If you look at the bottom there, you see the subcontinent of India. Look at how small India is compared to this uh, area called Yakutia, which is rich in resources. Here we have the Yakuts. And this map, I think, is useful in capturing the conquest of Siberia. I'm now going to move now south from the forest, from the taiga of Siberia, into the land of the Kazakhs. Uh, Kazakhs, the Sufi Muslim descendants of the Golden Horde. So there are three sort of uh, major Kazakh tribes or hordes, the three Kazakh hordes, the great, middle, and small horde. And below them, of course, are the land of the Uzbeks. This conquest of the open plains was made possible by new technology, faster loading weapons, tabors, wagons created by the Cossacks to go out in the open plains and clash with the Cossacks who had always been hard to defeat because they were such skilled horse archers. Remember, these are the descendants of the Golden Horde still using those tactics. But by the 1700s, when the Russians moved south into the open steppes, their archery is no longer able to defeat the Russians who have better weapons, firearms, small cannons, etc. This movement down south into the lands of the Kazakhs was similar in some ways to the American movement into the lands of the Sioux Indians, Cheyenne. The Indians are Native Americans of the open plains of America and it led to the disruption of ancient migration patterns going back to the Scythians, or the Scythi uh, in Poruski. Uh, so this is the, sort of the death of the great nomadic culture of the Kazakhs as they got absorbed uh, by Russia and of course ultimately colonized and and brought into the Soviet Union, where their society is completely disrupted. Once again, these migration patterns go back to the ancient European Scythians, uh, thousands and thousands of years old, destroyed by this settlement, just as the native indigenous Americans uh, colonies, you know, their, their patterns were destroyed by white man's uh, colonization. And finally, of course, having conquered the Kazakhs, by the 1800s, the Russians moved south into the three khanates of Uzbekistan. In the process, the name Turkestan, which goes back over a thousand years, was ultimately removed from the map. And today, most people have never heard the word Turkestan. This is a famous painting by Vereshagin, uh, Russian soldiers fighting against the uh, Uzbeks uh, south of the Kazakhs. Now I'm moving towards the west, uh, into Ukraine, the frontier. This was known as the Dikaipolia, the wild fields. And for centuries, the Russians were unable to move down on these open plains due to the fact that the Tatars were so invincible. The Tatars did slave raids deep into Russia. The Tatars burned Moscow as late as 1571, uh, carrying away hundreds of thousands of Poles, Moldovans, and Russians uh, as slaves down to Crimea. Crimea comes from the Mongol word Krim, which means fortress. And in many ways, the Crimea was a natural fortress for the Turco-Muslim world to stop the Slavs, to stop the Russians from moving south into the open plains, the Dikaipolia, of what's today Ukraine, the frontier. 
Of course, we know that the Ukrainians had their own separate culture at uh, this time period. You know, there's a major effort on the part of the Putin administration to deny Ukraine's identity, to say, oh, they're just little Russians. But we know that the Ukrainians, as you see this map here, had hundreds of years of Western influence uh, under the, the Poles and Lithuanians. Of course, later, they break up and form these free groups known as the Cossacks. Same origin as the word Kazakh, yeah, a freebooter, a free-roaming egalitarian people. Uh, the most famous Cossacks, of course, the Cossacks of the Zaporozhian Sikh, uh, the Zaporozhian fortress uh, down in the lower part of the Ukraine. They had an organic, almost indigenous, free form of democracy that was vastly different to serfdom, which you find under Russia. And don't forget, when the Russians did expand into these lands, they brought serfdom with them, a form of slavery that many of these ethnic groups had never had before. For example, when they conquered the Crimea, the Tatars had always been free under their own mirrors, their, their chieftains. But when the Russians came in, they confiscated the land, blew up many of the mosques, and forced the collapse of the ancient Crimean Tatar people. In the purple here, you can see the Zaporozhian Cossacks, right there squeezed between the Crimean Khanate, the expanding Russian Empire, and Poland, a sort of free zone of free egalitarian Cossacks. Uh, this painting, the famous painting by Repin, I think captures the real egalitarian friendship and democracy of the original Ukrainian Cossacks of Zaporozhia. Of course, Zaporozhia today is a, a major power plant that's being controlled by the Russians. Now, this movement of Russia from the Cossack lands and down south into Ukraine ultimately brings them down in confrontation of the Crimean Khanate. This Khanate extended, as you can see, from Moldova across the southern Ukraine all the way over to Circassia and acted as a shield protecting these regions from Slavic expansion. When this area was conquered in 1774 by Catherine the Great, it led to the complete collapse of this society. I should mention, there's a lot of propaganda about the Crimean Tatars. The Russians like to define them often as being Mongols. But if you live with the Crimean Tatars, as I've done, you'll see that their faces are very, very much pre-Mongol. Their origins go back to the Crimean Goths, uh, the Crimean Greeks, and other groups that are centuries older than the Mongol Golden Horde. Of course, the, the Bagchisarai Garden Palace uh, there in Crimea is the last example of uh, Mongol uh, palatial architecture uh, in Europe. So the Crimea was independent from the time period here, but in 1783, ironically, the year that America achieved independence, the Crimea lost its independence and led to a complete collapse of this society. Most of the Tatars, by the way, lived in the south, in the yellow there, in the Yaila Mountains. Uh, there were two groups of Tatars. One are called Nogais. Nogais are, are almost like Kazakhs, or are the wandering tribes of Kazakhstan, whereas the ones in the south are called Tots. And there are ancient people with blue eyes, blonde hair, going back to the Crimean Goths, although they both call themselves Crimean Tatars. Once again, the collapse of society led to mass migrations of Crimean Tatars engaging in hijra, religious immigration from Crimea to the Ottoman Empire. They called the Ottoman Empire Aktoprak, white soil. It was seen as salvation for them to escape their mosques being burnt, the graveyards of their ancestors being destroyed, and of course, all the land being confiscated by Russian pomeshchiks, large landowners. Now, here's some pictures I took uh, while living in the Crimea. Uh, this is the Crimean Tatars' uh, palace there at Bagchisarai. And what you see, they're not all sort of Mongol physiognomy. Many of them have this pre-Mongol uh, look to their faces. These are Samozaklat, self-seized settlements uh, in the Yaila Mountains of southern Crimea. Uh, this is Mustafa Jimilov, uh, the head of the Crimean Tatars. As their standards. This collapse of the Crimea, the fortress Crimea, ultimately led to the migration of the Russians towards the Northern Caucasus. Now that the Tatars were gone, these almost un unbeatable Tatar archers, once the cavalry forces of the Crimean Khan had been defeated, it opened up the Caucasus Mountains for Russian expansion. And this leads, of course, to the destruction of Circassia. If you look on this map, you will see four great nations in the Caucasus at this time period. Azerbaijan, uh, Georgia, Armenia, and the green there, Circassia. Most people on the planet have never heard of Circassia. I was at a conference in New York of Armenians, and they proudly told me, well, not proudly, but sadly, 
Armenia had the world's first modern genocide in Europe. I asked them, haven't you heard of the Circassians? They'd never even heard of the Circassians. This nation uh, had its own rich history. Much of the traditions we think of being Caucasian come from Circassia. Here we can see in the purple area there, the beginning of the Russian conquest of Circassia. This conquest is achieved by massive imperial armies burning and chopping down the forest. You could not conquer the free Circassians or the tribes to the east in Dagestan and Chechnya unless you destroyed the forest where they fought back from. They waged almost guerrilla war, insurgency. I call this the Battle of the Axe. The Russians systematically destroyed one of the largest forests in Europe. And now when you go to the Northern Caucasus, these ancient forests going back millennia are missing, chopped down to allow the Russians with a much larger imperial armies to move in and conquer these areas by about 1864. Here we see the legendary Circassians. And of course, the collapse of Circassia, which my colleagues will discuss uh, by 1860s, led to the mass migration of Circassians down into Ottoman Empire. Uh, I spent a lot of time living in Turkey, and there's many, many people in Turkey today who have the features uh, of Circassia. Of course, I also found Circassians living in Israel, in Kafir Kama. I found them way down south where the Ottoman Sultan settled them. And of course, this leads, once Circassia gets destroyed, it leads to subjugation of Imam Shamil and the defense of uh, the combined Chechen, English, and Dagestani forces uh, to the east. So, in many ways, as an American, we are taught that our people, our ancestors, the English and, of course, the Americans who moved, as you see in this picture here, across the open plains, engaged in genocide. We are taught to be embarrassed by this bloody conquest of the free Native American people, the Sioux, the Cheyenne, Cherokee, Navajo, etc. Uh, we honor them in many ways, but we were taught that this is a, almost like a, a collective sin on the part of our nation, uh, the Americans. Back in the 1800s, they called it manifest destiny. Uh, the English called it the white man's burden. The French called it mission civil Uh Russians did it for the honor of the Tsar, orthodoxy, and uh, of course, uh, the Russian nation. Today, we know it by a different name, genocide. Thank you. Professor Williams, thank you very much indeed for this broad overview. Um, the, the, you mention so frequently the fate of uh, Circassians nation. And uh, actually, we are proud to, to host for the second time here in the parliament representative, a brave representative of this uh, uh, nation, Fatima Atlis, uh, who, who used to, to, to be uh, activist, uh, uh, speaking up about Circassians' rights. Uh, and within the Russian Federation, endangered there, evacuated to the United States, now serving as journalists in the voice of uh, of uh, America, uh, we we had already a conference dedicated uh, uh, uniquely to, to genocide of Circassians. Genocide is in the title of our conference, so it is inevitable to speak about modern age uh, genocide uh, first uh, happening uh, to Circassians. Uh, on territory of Russia and by Russians. Uh, Fatima, floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, and thank you again for inviting me here. And thank you for giving this floor and this tribune to my people, whom I represent proudly today. Um, as you've heard from uh, Professor Williams and from Honorable Anna Fatiga, my nation, uh, Circassia, um, doesn't exist anymore. Uh, as a result of uh, similar aggression that began 200 years ago, Circassia was eliminated, its territories annexed, its people exterminated, 
and deported. We are approaching the nine-year anniversary of uh, Russia's colonial aggression in Ukraine. Similar, what we see in Ukraine was experienced by my nation, my people. There are at least six times more Circassians living abroad than there are Circassians remaining in their occupied by, uh, motherland, occupied by Russia. I was born and raised in the Circassian mountains. And when I grew up, I visited as a journalist Circassian diasporas in many countries. They are doctors, scholars, entrepreneurs, they are politicians, generals, builders, bakers. They are assets to their new homes, to their new countries. And like in their new countries, they, their new countries are different from each other. The Circassians living in those countries are different too. But they have um, things in common. For instance, they are all longing for Circassia for the home Russia has taken from them. In the Circassian language, the word for nation is shabq, translated as a foundation. Again, nation in Circassian is a foundation. Today, Circassians of the world live deprived of their foundation. With every passing day, there are less Circassians speaking their mother tongue. There are less Circassians who identify themselves as Circassians and less Circassians who have connection with their foundation, their shabq. We often hear the phrase, the 19th century genocide of Circassians by Russia, as if Russia's destruction of the Circassian nation was a one-time event that had a beginning and the ending. That is a wrong concept. The Circassians are at the brink of ex extinction. Re-establishing their nationhood, rebuilding their foundation is a matter of survival. That is a continuation of a genocide. The Circassians today are deeply infiltrated and corroded by the Russian intelligences. They are divided and confused. But most importantly, they are losing hope forever going home to their beautiful mountains. I'd like to address my people at the end of my speech today. Imagine freedom. You are doing so many great things for the countries that you call your own right now. Imagine doing those great things for your own countries, for your foundation, for your nation, for your homeland. And believe in that. It is possible. Thank you. Thank you, Fatima, for your deeply moving uh, contribution. Well, what we learned during uh, the previous conference and also Fatima's and colleagues from Georgia contribution to that conference was uh, the activity of Georgia in support of Circassians at a time when uh, we just uh, referred to literature, to 19th century literature, while speaking about Circassians or thought about history. Uh, Georgian's assessment was very clear, very political, and very visionary. And I would like to pay tribute to a to personal prisoner of Putin nowadays, uh, Mikhail Saakashvili, who used to initiate this. Uh, the, our next speaker actually does not need introduction. <laughs> he, there is a hero among us. 
simply there are many of them, but he is uh, a very special and particular person. Also not for the first time here in the European uh, Parliament. The Prime Minister of, of uh, Free Independent uh, uh, che uh, Chechen Republic of each Korea, Ahmed Zakayev. Ahmed, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will speak in, in Russian. Uh, I would like to welcome the participant guests of this forum. And before starting my speech, I would like to thank the organizers of this event for the invitation and the opportunity to take the floor. And then I would like to particularly thank MEP Anna Fatiga and uh, the Polish government and the people of Poland for the fact that they have been tirelessly monitoring the situation in Chechnya for the past 28 years and providing us with the fraternal assistance in this difficult period of our history. More than 40,000 Chechen refugees fleeing the horrors of war found shelter in Poland. It will soon be a year since the Russian aggression in Ukraine. And it was Poland that was the first to come to the aid of the defenders of their country. In addition to everything else, more than one and a half million Ukrainians were received by the Poles in their homes. Thank you very much for this, Anna. Well, now about the main topic of our conference, about the restructuring of Russia after its defeat in the war. Uh, with Ukraine. In my speech, I would like to focus on one of its regions, the North Caucasus. The North Caucasus has always played a big role in the history of Russia, and this region is in the geopolitical zone, not only uh, of Russia, which controls it, but also of several countries, including Georgia and Azerbaijan. In the Russian Empire, Tsar's general secretaries and presidents changed. The political structure changed. The monarchy was uh, replaced by Bolshevism and the Soviet Empire exist for more than 70 years, which was replaced by pseudo-democracy. However, Russia's main attitude towards Caucasians to subdue or exterminate them has never changed. At the beginning of the 18th century, the active phase of the conquest of the Caucasus began through the settlement of its territory by Russian colonists. The process was accompanied by millions of victims. As a result of this colonization of the Caucasus, millions of people were killed and thousands of villages were devastated, which led to the disappearance of entire Caucasian peoples, Ubechs, Janevs, uh, Kakuches. The systematic murder of the peoples of the Caucasus has intensified since the end of the Russian-Turkish war, when the Russian troops burned thousands of villages, exterminating all the inhabitants, including women and children. The onslaught of the terrorist troops on the Caucasian people caused their unification. The first general movement of the North Caucasian Highlanders against the expansion of the Russian Empire in the Caucasus at the end of the 18th century was led by Sheikh Mansour. It was a response directed against uh, the cruel colonial policy of Tsarist Russia. The Caucasians had their own historical state, which was destroyed several times by the Russians. In the 19th century, Imam Shamil created the Caucasian Imamat, which for several decades waged an effective war against Russia. The significant numerical superiority of the Russian army made it possible in all cases to drown in blood all the attempts of the Highlanders to freedom. At the beginning of the 20th century, after the October Revolution in Russia, the Gorska Republic was proclaimed, which included the republics of North Caucasus, Officially, the independence of the Gorska Republic was proclaimed on May 11, 1918, at a peace conference uh, in Batumi. The territory of the partially recognized state covered 125,000 square kilometers, with a population of about 2.9 million people. Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Gorska Republic, limited by diplomatic non-recognition from the victors in the First World War, in particular France and Great Britain, and under this 
difficult conditions, uh, the Gorskaya Mountain Republic signed recognition treaties with the Ottoman Empire, Germany, Austria, Hungary and Bulgaria. Since all these countries were defeated in the First World War and did not play a significant role in world politics at that time, this mountainous Gorska Republic experienced problems in strengthening its statehood. Considering Russia's ongoing aggression in Ukraine today, the union of the Ukrainian People's Republic and the Gorska Mountainous Republic is deeply symbolic. In 1919, an agreement was made between the Directory of the Ukrainian People's Republic and the Parliament of the Gorska Mountains Republic. I'm not going to state uh, uh, what was written over there, but I think my assistant have already distributed what was written down in this agreement. As we know from history, both the Ukrainian People's Republic and the Gorska Republic were defeated by the Bolsheviks. The Tsarist colonial policy gave way to the dictatorship of the proletariat and destroyed everything, even the smallest spirits of freedom and democracy. Despite the active participation of the peoples of the Caucasus in the establishment of the Soviets after its consolidation, Soviet power took over the peoples of the North Caucasus, and again, entire peoples became enemies, and a new wave of the genocide of the North Caucasian peoples begins. Chechens, Karachai, Ingush, Balkars became victims of the murderous policy of the Soviet state. After 70 years, a new era begins in the history of the Russian state. And it is accompanied by the practice of intimidation, terror, murder, and violence, not only in the North Caucasus, but also Moldova, Transnistria, Georgia, Abkhazia, Ossetia, Azerbaijan, Nagorno-Karabakh, Ingushiria, and the Chechen Republic. Uh, but Caucasians never cease to use the slightest opportunity to free themselves from the colonial yoke and revive their united statehood. After the collapse of the USSR, the Chechen people used their right to independence and declared on September 6, 1991, the day of the restoration of the state independence of the Chechen Republic. In October 1991, Georgian President Zviad Gamsahurdia and the President of the Chechen Republic of Shkere Johar Dudaev began to discuss the project of the Caucasian Confederation. In December 1991, January 92, a coup took place in Georgia, as a result of which President Zviad Gamsahurdia was removed, and Eduard Shevardnadze, who was supported by Russia, came to power. And in, che in the Chechen Republic, uh, the Kremlin began to form an armed opposition which was supposed to overthrow the popular, uh, popularly elected government and establish a pro-Russian occupation regime. These attempts were unsuccessful until the end of the 1994. In December 1994, Russia launched a large-scale war. Russian Defense Minister Pavel Grachov promised President Boris Yeltsin to restore order in Chechnya in two hours with one airborne regiment. In the 28 years since the start of the Russian-Chechen war, Russia was able to colonize the Chechen Republic, to occupy it, and plant its own Collab uh, collaborationist government, but failed to break the struggle of the Chechen people for their independence. The government of the Chechen Republic, which carries working successfully in exile. As a result of the signing of an agreement between the military departments of the two countries, the armed force of the uh, Chechen Republic which here, uh, are fighting today as part of the armed force of Ukraine. The Chechens were very enthusiastic about the recognition by the Ukrainian Rada of the fact that Russia occupied the territory of the Chechen Republic of Ichkeria, which was the reason for the entry into the armed forces of the Chechen Republic of Ichkeria of many volunteers fighting against the Russian aggressor. The Chechens are confident that Ukraine's victory in the war against Russia will allow them to deoccupy the territory of the Chechen Republic of Ichkeria and restore their statehood. At present, the best representatives of the enslaved and occupied peoples of the Caucasus are fighting on the Ukrainian front, repelling enemy attacks and liberating the occupied lands of Ukraine. There is confidence that the courageous and heroic resistance of the Ukrainian army to the Russian invaders and the world support of the struggling people of Ukraine will break the back of the Russian aggressors. 
In connection with the foregoing, I would like to urge the participants of this forum to appeal to the international community guided by the generally accepted principles and norms of international law, such as on the right of the nation to self-determination, the resolution of the UN Gen General Assembly 2105, dating back to December 20, 1965, resolution 2625 of uh, November 24, 1970, UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, dated October 13, 2007, number 61 slash 295, appeal to the parliaments and leaders of the UN member states with an appeal to recognize the right of the right to self-determination of the peoples forcibly held by Russia expressed in the right of the oppressed people to freely decide the issue of state status and independently carry out their cultural and economic development. All these years, the peoples of the North Caucasus have been closely watching the struggle of the Chechens for freedom and are waiting for international recognition of the right of the Chechen people to their statehood to start their own struggle for independence and in the future to recreate, considering modern realities, the Caucasian Confederation following the example of the Confederation of Mountain Peoples of 1918 and our government on May 11, the celebrate the 105th uh, uh, anniversary of this republic, we plan to organize a conference in order to reanimate this, this state. And considering the context of what is going on in the world and considering what is going on in the international community, we see the necessity of restructuring reforming the Russian state to create a new state. And in this context, I think that it will be very important to come back to this uh, uh, Gorskaya Mountain Republic, which was recognized by the tens of countries of the international community. And uh, I think that this project will find support, would it be in Washington or in the EU, our Minister of Foreign Affairs went to Washington with this project, uh, and I talked with Anna Fatiga today and will present this new project of this new state uh, here at the European Union and will present it to Anna Fatiga over here. Thanks for your attention and thanks for having listened to me over here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you. It was extremely important contribution to this conference. Now something for Domosua. Allow me with great pleasure to to present the representative of, of uh, Poland, the outstanding Polish scholar, historian, specializing in history of diplomacy and totalitarian regimes, Sovietologist as well, uh, Professor Marek Konrad, uh, Kornat. I'm a, I'm very sorry because of, of lack of Polish interpretation during this conference. Uh, I, I invite him only in Polish to take this floor. Please allow me to, to, do, to have this pleasure, short pleasure during this uh, conference. Panie Profesorze, bardzo proszę. Dziękuję. Thank you very much. Madam Fotyga, I would like to limit myself uh, to some general general remarks uh, concerning the problem of uh, Russian tradition of imperialism and Soviet imperialism uh, in the 20th uh, century. <coughs> the remark number one, I think, should be devoted to the imperial character of the pre-revolutionary Russia. Um, the main factor which permitted to uh, establish Russia in the role of a great international um, power was the uh, 
dismemberment of Poland in the end of 18th century. The dismemberment of Polish-Lithuanian Republic or Commonwealth in the other words. Uh, the crisis of Polish state and the foreign domination on Poland, on Polish territories, uh, on the territories of uh, Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, uh, had significant geopolitical dimension for Europe, for the construction of the European balance of power, for the European concert of power, to which uh, Russia belonged uh, until the Great War, which uh, was started in 1914. Uh, partitions of Poland permitted Russia to enter to the center of Europe. And we can imagine easily the precarious situation of uh, Polish nation, Polish people, after the partitions, when we say that um, 80% of the repartition territories of Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth uh, was under Russian domination after the uh, Congress of Vienna, when uh, a small Polish kingdom was re-established in the dynastic union with Russia. Let me uh, say that it is highly difficult highly difficult to imagine the history of uh, 19th century and the history of the 20th century without, without uh, mentioning uh, the problem of the partitions of Poland, which cannot be neglected in, uh, in not only European history, but especially in the Central European geopolitical uh, geopolitical constellation. The durable consequences of the partitions of Poland uh, are present in contemporary uh, geopolitical situation because Russia was the benefactor of this situation, of the uh, partitions of Poland, and uh, it became the great power uh, after uh, the collapse of uh, Poland uh, and Russia entered to the center of Europe. Uh, uh, remark number two, in 19th century, we can say that uh, Russian imperialism, Russian imperialism codified uh, some ideas of the external expansion. I mean, especially the idea of the dismemberment of Turkey, Crimean War, and the Eastern Crisis of 1876-78, uh, which was ended by a compromise, compromise adopted uh, on the Congress of Berlin. And in the second, especially in the second half of the 19th century, we can uh, we can uh, not neglect, it is impossible to neglect, the second idea of Russian ex uh, external expansion. I mean the idea of uh, uh, um, cry, uh, the idea of dismemberment of Austro-Hungary, of Austria, which was strictly connected with the idea of Panslavism. This was one of the reasons, principal reasons, of the Austro-Russian conflict which led Europe to the war in uh, 1914. Russian Tsarist foreign policy, of course, was a, was a peaceful policy, so to say, because uh, Russia participated in the uh, European concert, but post-Vienna-Russia policy uh, was a policy of gendarm of Europe, uh, and then especially under Nicholas I. And secondly, uh, we have a visible coexistence of the participation in the uh, European uh, concert of powers with the 
ex ideas of external expansions uh, against Turkey and Austria especially. The reflection number three, in my short overview, we must uh, devote some time to the collapse of the Russian Empire in 1917 and to the political disorder in uh, Eastern Europe uh, after the collapse of uh, the Russian monarchy and the two revolutions in 1917. Uh, this disorder is not neglected in historiography of Russia and Europe. I will be speaking on rather well-known uh, well facts in history, but I think that Polish historian should um, observe that it was a turning point in European history. However, however, it appeared finally impossible to reconstruct to reconstruct new, the imperialized Eastern Europe without Russian Empire. This idea belonged to the main conceptions of Marshal Piłsudski, as we know, and uh, he should be mentioned as the architect of the Polish-Ukrainian alliance. We can generally, in, in, in some words, say that Piłsudski had two ideas, the idea of federalism with uh, Lithuania and Belarus, and to uh, re-establish Ukrainian uh, state, and uh, Piłsudski's idea of Ukraine was the idea of uh, Ukraine in the role of ally of Poland, the ally of Poland, uh, strategic ally against Russia, of course. The alliance of uh, April 1920 appeared finally unsuccessful, as we know, and Piłsudski's program was given up after the victorious war against Soviet Russia, but this victorious war was ended by the peace of compromise. We can, we can say that peace of compromise, which was, uh, which was adopted in Riga in March 1921. Uh, from Polish point of view, the Riga uh, Treaty can be can be described as a piece of compromise. From Ukrainian point of view, it was some kind of partition of Ukrainian uh, territories between Poland and, and, and communist Russia. And from Soviet perspective, it was only an armistice, only an armistice in the time of uh, weakness of Russia. And uh, the peace lasted only to 1939 when it was uh, violated by the Red Army on September 17. Finally, Russia after 1917 was not the imperialized, it was rebuilt as an empire. Intensive Sovietization of non-Russian nations uh, inside the Soviet Union in the Stalinist era became the instrument, the instrument of communist utopia, but also of domination, of domination, communist domination uh, of this empire of new time, new type empire. We have generally a discussion in Polish historiography, in Polish Sovietology, uh, uh, well-known Polish historian Jan Kucharzewski argued that, uh, argued that uh, the uh, Russian nation is the factor profiting profiting in the Soviet uh, imperialism and expansionism. The totally different point of view was uh, proposed by no more well-known uh, um, person in Polish intellectual history, I mean writer Józef Mackiewicz, who argued that uh, Russia is not a typically colonial uh, empire because Russian nation is the first victim of totalitarian regime. These are uh, concrete words of Józef Mackiewicz. Um, in reality, and, and I think that that will be my last uh, reflection due to the limits of time, in reality, 
Soviet policy under Stalin in 1930s, in the last decade before the outbreak of the Second World War, was not a peaceful policy. It is true that Soviet diplomacy promoted the idea of collective security, collective security, a bloc of Eastern and uh, Central European states against Germany. But it was only a propaganda, a propaganda formula. Uh, it, was only, it was only a theory. In reality, Soviet Union, uh, Soviet Union in 1930s wanted to rebuild, rebuild the domination on uh, Central Europe, on these, uh, these territories which were lost after the crisis of the uh, Russian Empire, after the Great War and the geopolitical revolution in, Europe, in Central and Eastern Europe in 19. Uh, 19, uh, 19, 1920. Um, for, for Russia, under Stalin, for the Soviet Union under Stalin, there were two possibilities. To achieve the main aim in cooperation with the Western powers, the idea was attempted uh, in 1934, when the proposal, French proposal of Eastern Pact was discussed in the diplomatic cabinet of Europe, I mean the Eastern Pact as a proposal for, of collective security, uh, which was uh, supported by Litvinov and uh, Commissar Litvinov and Soviet diplomacy, but the other partner, the other partner was Germany, and finally, finally. Soviet Union achieved the main aim in the Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact. Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact was not an accident. Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact was the, uh, some kind of uh, uh, coronation of Soviet uh, Stalinist vision of foreign policy. And last remark, the uh, genocide in the totalitarian Soviet state was the instrument of the, of the, uh, of the uh, totalitarian rule, and especially we cannot omit such problem like uh, the extermination of Polish population in the Soviet Union, uh, 200,000 people in the years 1970, uh, 1937-38. Uh, of, of course, uh, Polish, uh, Polish society, Polish, uh, Polish people in the Soviet Union were not a unique victim of this cruel dictatorship, but uh, it is, I think it is the obligation of Polish historians not, uh, not to neglect this factor when we have in the topic of our conference the idea of, uh, the idea of uh, genocide which is strictly associated with the uh, totalitarian rule uh, uh, in the Soviet Union. Soviet Union was the first totalitarian regime, first, not Italian fascism and not uh, German Nazism, but uh, Russia, uh, Lenin was the inventor of totalitarian uh, regime. Thank you very much for these brief remarks. Professor Cornett, thank you very much indeed. Now time has come to, for, for the Russian angle of, of this. We welcome to the podium uh, the outstanding Russian speaker, uh, Professor Vladislav Inoziemtsev, uh, head of Moscow-based uh, Center for Research of uh, post-industrial societies, but uh, uh, frequently a lecturer uh, um, elsewhere in the United States, uh, uh, prestigious university, uh, lectures as well as in France and other places. Uh, he's the author of quite well-known uh, Foresight of Russia, uh, post-2030. So, <laughs> well, Professor, for others, yours. 
Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, I'm very grateful for everybody who organized this outstanding event and who invited me here. Uh, so I will try, uh, I will do my best to restore the agenda of our meeting and to turn back to the questions which were posed on the first panel. So uh, it's about the history of the Russian Empire and the Russian imperialism, about the current events and what ties and what lines uh, can uh, actually help to explain the continuation of uh, the Russian imperialist tradition. I would say that I was very interested in uh, Professor uh, Brian Williams' uh, introduction and uh, his thesis, uh, but I would say, they, from my point of view, they are a little bit superficial, because uh, the Russian Empire is very much uh, similar to the Western European empires, and it's very much different from it in many ob obstacles. What is the similarity? The similarity, from my point of view, is that the Russian imperialism, it was not Russian imperialism, actually, first of all. It was the Muscovite imperialism, because Russia didn't exist at the time when Muscovy started its imperial expansion. And the imperial expansion of Muscovy, starting from the late 15th century, was very similar to what happened, uh, what was done by the European powers. Uh, both European powers and Muscovy expanded uh, on the west-east line. So the European powers expanded across the Atlantic uh, to, uh, to both Americas, like the French in Louisiana, the British in certain colonies, the Spanish and the Portuguese in South America, and the Russian went uh, an opposite way uh, to the east, conquering Tatar, uh, Kanite, uh, Siberian Kanite, and then ending <coughs> in the Pacific Ocean. This was, as I believe, it was a time of, um, uh, of uh, I would say, true colonial, colonialism. It was a colonization um, when the massive masses of people from the metropolises resettled in these colonies and actually this was a time of genocide, of terrible genocide, both from the Russian side and both from the European side in the Americas. Uh, and the result was the new colonial uh, empire, uh, which was inhabited and populated in some significant degree by the representatives of the metropolis. The Russians migrated to Siberia in great numbers, the Englishmen, the French, the Huguenots, uh, the Dutch people, the Germans migrated to North America, the Spaniards and Portuguese to South America, and they actually, they all built in these territories the societies which were very similar to their own and their homelands. The second part of the colonial process uh, came around 200 years later, when both, once again, both European uh, imperial powers and uh, Moscovy, I would say later Russia, turned southwards, uh, when the Russians invaded Caucasian uh, territories, uh, Central Asia, uh, Crimea, uh, territories which were previously occupied and controlled by Turkey, and the European powers turned south to India, uh, the uh, partition of Africa, in, in the China, and all other places. What was very particular in this case, that neither Europeans nor the Russians never made the majority of population in the southern territories. <coughs> nor in Rhodesia, nor in India, nor in Tajikistan. The colonial powers never have a huge uh, presence of their own population. It was a kind of military control. And uh, what now the second part, what differs uh, the Russian Empire from the European empires? The Russian Empire expanded gradually, while the European empires expanded from time to time. So in the late 18th century and the early 19th century, the European empires, the first European empires collapsed. And uh, the United States of America, the, uh, the nations like Brazil, uh, Venezuela, Colombia, Argentina, uh, Mexico, they appeared as uh, independent nations. In Russia, it never happened. Russia made another wave of expansion when for the Europeans it was a subsequent wave. Uh, for Russia, it was, you know, another wave, like a Matryoshka empire. So the another very big difference is that all the European imperial expansion appeared only after uh, the corresponding European countries became nation states. Spain started its expansion in the, into Americas in the early 15th century after the reunification of Spain in 1492. Uh, French expansion, overseas expansion, was also following from the creation of French 
uh, unitary state uh, under the Louis XIII. Uh, then uh, the same with England. The same uh, Portuguese, well, Portuguese were the first uh, consolidated states in Europe uh, since 1382. Uh, Never Prussia uh, or uh, Piemont uh, had a colonial experience because they never, as they became nation state of Italy and Germany, they started this expansion. Empire of Moscow was very different because Moscow was never a nation state. And the empire it created, which was actually occasionally named Russia, a called Russia since the middle of 17th century, was also never a nation state. It was an empire in itself. So therefore, the Euro European nations, they were later reduced to their original territory. And this was, of course, a huge and a very painful process. But the Europeans, they recreated their identity because they have it before. And, and Russia has a very different situation in this case because when the Russian Empire collapsed in 1991, it was a real tragedy for the people because there are two major uh, points in, in Russian history. First of all, Russia as Russia uh, appeared when uh, it actually annexed or uh, appropriated, I would not uh, take a much sense of the word, uh, the Eastern Ukraine in uh, 1654. Uh, since this time, uh, the titles of the Moscow rulers became the Tsars of Russia from the great count of Moscow and the Tsars of Rus. And so for, therefore, uh, for Russia, uh, part of Ukraine and Belarus and all these territories, they seem to be an integral part of what was called Russia in ancient times. And therefore, it's very, it creates a huge identity problem for the Russians. And it's not only Mr. Putin who is responsible for the war in Ukraine, I would say, but the Russian people as well. Uh, it's very much supportive of it. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very sad story to say, but I, was, uh, I would tell you that it's not only you know, a Kremlin project. It's, uh, in, in many cases, it's a project of the Russian people who understand its history in this way. And another point is that because Russia never experienced contraction, for example, like England, uh, after it lost, lost the United States, the certain colonies, since Russia never experienced contraction, every kind of loss of the territory is uh, perceived as a national tragedy and problem for the Russians. So this, is, this makes Russia a very unique, aggressive, uh, and uh, actually hostile empire, which, will, which presents and will present for a long time to, to, to go a huge existential threat to the European world. Uh, the last point I would make here, because it's, uh, it's uh, not, not, many, not much time, I would say that uh, is, uh, the Russian Mir idea is, I think, very misleading. Why? Because the Soviet communists, uh, when they tried to re-establish the Russian Empire territory, uh, in a territorial sense in 1917 or afterwards, they actually abandoned the very mention of Russia. It was the Soviet Union. It was not a Russian Union. Yeah? It was a Soviet Union. They seized the idea of Russiousness uh, for getting back all these republics inside the umbrella of the Soviet Union. Now, uh, the problem is that, uh, and it was like a kind of international idea which can cover all the world and whatsoever. Now, they try to expand in the name of Russian world, which is, I would say, a very contradictory idea. Because if Russia uh, created or declared itself in 1991 a Republic of Moscow, it would be a very different situation because Moscow is not hostile to Ukraine, it's not hostile to Belarus, it's not hostile to Moldova, because Moscow would be a kind of territorial uh, state which can actually reform itself inside of it. When you say Russia, you immediately think about all the Russians who are dispersed all over the post-Soviet region, and this makes you potentially aggressive, what we have seen since 1992. It was not Putin who started the war in Ukraine. It was Yeltsin who started the war in Chechnya. It was Yeltsin who actually started the war in Moldova, uh, and also in Georgia and Abkhazia. So I would say that the Russian state, if it is called Russian state, produces the idea of Russian world, and this uh, continues into a kind of aggressive policy. If it is reduced to Moscow, it is, if it can somehow uh, live with this new identity, 
trying to establish more equal relationship with the peoples and nations inside this Moscow territory, it would be another story. The la very last remark is that, yes, I believe that Ukraine will prevail in this war uh, with the help of the collective West, and the Russian forces will be expelled uh, from all the occupied territories. But what I do not believe, actually, is that this will lead to the collapse and uh, breakup of Russia. Because, you know, the French uh, colonial empire, the English colonial empire, the Spanish colonial empire, all they collapsed, but not Spain, not United Kingdom, not France. It's not about, you know, uh, the Spain lost the uh, Philippines and many other territories, but it hadn't lost Catalonia so far. So therefore, I'm not so sure that there are a lot of prerequisites for the Russian uh, state to collapse uh, and, and to be split over. But uh, anyway, we are now in fight with very specific empire, and we should very, very carefully analyze what the kind of empire we are facing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Now I kindly ask our staff to, to initiate the, our first remote connection. Our speaker is Bjorn Safranov, representing the activist representing uh, uh, Lapland Republic from Murmansk. the opportunity to attend this conference. This is very important for my region and me in particular. Before starting my speech, I have to tell you that I am not on the territory, uh, now I am on the territory of Russia. And therefore, my votes are limited <coughs> and the, by the laws of the state. Let's get to the point. Most of the presented needs to be given a little context. My name is Bjorn Safranov. I am native of Kola Peninsula and I am a member of uh, Movement for Freedom. Yeah, we'll, they will name it like this. I will have to talk more about present and future than, than history. I will try to explain my region in terms of geography and geopolitics. Also, besides this, I will try to explain you the special situation with military settlements which are so common on the north, uh, in the north on the Russian territory, in this unpleasant place to live. Despite the fact that my region has a huge history and amazing past from a barely controlled territory with one of the oldest autonomous people of Europe to a de facto outpost and military colony with a predominantly non indigenous people, I will not touch on it. You don't need to listen a huge history of a region that currently has a less than million people. A lot has already been said about Russian colonialism, as well as genocide and popular displacement. The Kola Peninsula is an interesting to others. is uh, better to start with uh, why you even want to hear about a place like Kola Peninsula. This place is the main naval base of Russian Northern Fleet. It's built on duty uh, and port activity, activities and fishing. This is a very strange place. It's not like Central Russia. These people are so different from them, from Moscow, Petersburg people, uh, because in case of nature, in case of uh, duty and uh, an autonomous people traditions like Sami people or Pomo people. For example, people from Kola Peninsula try to eat reindeer more often than in Central Russia. But uh, <coughs> this is uh, one main question about this region is uh, why I am talking about it right now. Because in the uh, Russia-Ukrainian war 
or specific military operation like it's called here uh, we can see the very interesting social institution of imperial legitimacy imperial legitimacy is what now creates loyalty to the Putin regime from military power it's important to understand that now the military is not fighting for the country they are fighting for themselves and for the right monarch monarch this is very strange thing since the oath of the president is given only by the troops of national guard and all other troops gave it to the constitution of russian federation but since in russia constitution is a piece of paper with the sake of with nothing is hidden no sacred meaning no legal force absolutely nothing this is why if the uh, president is demolished and has no hair then the troops will fight only for themselves and a funny situation fallen from this i'm going to have uh, i'm going to have to give uh, honest but unpleasant information from now you see the the policy of military settlement the northern region of russia have a large part of population included in military organization or directly depend on it therefore it's impossible for some regions to consider the option of demilitarization this will literally force these people to fight to the last breath. Look for opportunities in PMCs like Wagner's Corp, create new military organization and also create something like criminal gangs. But if they will get an alternative, if you will say that demilitarization will affect only on the Russians or something like this, uh, <coughs> there be these people after the collapse of the image of Putin which is already happening will clearly support our tendencies to freedom these people will do anything to keep their profession in which they have been far so long they have no future without military speci uh, speciality this is what they studied for and what they receive m and where they receive money their whole identity is based on what are they Therefore, this, this action is extremely important for them. But after receiving freedom, they can serve the whole community. Their craft can be directed to a good deed. They are good sailors. I'm studying in the, uh, in the Murmansk Marine College. I understand this. This is very important part of the Kola Peninsula region. This is extremely important for them. They will, of course, they will understand. Now they are understanding that the main problem of our region is unfortunately uh, rulers from Moscow because the government just tried to stall all their efficiency and re relocate all our resources to Moscow. It's not like uh, regular Siberian resources like oil or coal. It's more important than people population. Modern, modern Moscow colonialism is about to replacement a lot of people from their origin, uh, f from their original place for living, and try to make them Moscovites through the very strange process of uh, living in central russian city this is absolutely different from any part of russia it's more like uh, huge extremely huge uh, city state with uh, all russian territory under colonial government because not a lot of you know but uh, in russia we cannot elect our governor we cannot uh, elect anyone that's and only one true election is uh, usually in moscow that's why i should say the modern russian uh, uh, colonialism is the big threat for all people from the russia you know a lot of uh, migrants in Moscow like from Caucasian region from northern parts all they are trying to do their best for get, getting better lives but 
in the time they will corrupt under this strange empire. <coughs> Sorry. I would uh, also um, like to say about the problem of the extinction of autonomous people. I'm Kareel, who lived in the Sami village. I know a lot about uh, the basic of the extinction of entire ethnic groups, how it goes. To, re to perceive ethnic groups, it is necessary to preserve the traditional way of life. We have example of other countries in Scandinavia where the Sami population is only growing and it's already reaching at least some serious number, like in Lapland, uh, under Finnish or Sweden or Norwegian control. We see there's 20, 30, 40 thousand of people, but in Russia we see a decline, extinction of the Sami. Sami art is marginalized. It's like a Stone Age war. Mm, interesting. There is just no respect for any other culture than the modern Moscovite culture. It's not even Russian culture. It's just modernistic simulacre of culture that they try to give to all people, all ethnics in Russia. This is some monstrous kind of nationality. It's not like about original Russian or Slavic people, it's only about this simulacre that Moscow creates. <sighs> Thank you for letting me say that. That, is very, that was very important for me for telling you that things. Uh, especially thank you for Mr. William. He saved a lot of times for everyone here to explaining how actually Russian colonies worked. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Safranov. <laughs> uh, there is huge applause, so it was important for all of us. Thank you. Now, uh, I would like to give the floor to, to Anvar Kurmanakaev, uh, representing the Nogai uh, Republic, member of the National Political Center, of Nogai National Political Center, act political activist. Floor is yours. Good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I represent Nogai movement, and today I would like uh, to talk about uh, my people. A lot has been said on genocide today, and uh, before even the genocide of the Cherkessian people, Nogai people also faced genocide by Catherine II. It was in 1783, 1st of October, genocide of the Nogai people. Before it was 1,200,000 people in Nogai Horde. And they lived in the Caucasus, up to the steppes of Crimea. 5,100 of them were annihilated. They were deplaced. All the other uh, people were re uh, displaced uh, in other regions. Small settlements remained. So now we are very small people, present nowhere. So we are 100,000 people today, and we live uh, almost everywhere in small settlements, so no one can hear our voice. So first of all, we lost our Astrakhan Khanate, the capital of Nogai Horde. 
and this city has been occupied for the last 500 years. 200,000 uh, Nogai people live there and we want uh, to create a Nogai Republic in Astrakhan, a republic of this autochthonous people to get rid of uh, this external pressure. Well, in Astrakhan region, we have oil, we have gas in huge amounts, but local population gets nothing. Everything is exported to Moscow. Local population has no work. They have to go elsewhere for employment. So genocide continues. A lot of representatives of our people was mobilized, uh, was drafted to the Russian army to wage war in Ukraine, which is also maybe considered as an act of genocide uh, against our people. And I would like to stop this genocide. We need to do something with this empire. Uh, indigenous people should, people should get their lands so that they can be their own masters. An empire can create nothing. Pushkin, Lermontov, other Russian writers, read them. They reinvented in the Russian language some local tales. They created nothing themselves. An empire can't be creative. Only free people can create something. If you want our world to be better, if you want to have progress in our world, if, we were, if you want to have economic growth and general prosperity and well-being, then we need to get rid of the empires, free the people and give them possibility to develop themselves. That's the only way towards peace. Well, I believe it is so. So, today, I would like to make an appeal to the whole world. Please, genocide, uh, recognize the genocide of the Nogai people. 1783, 1st of October. Every year we commemorate this date. We mourn its victims. Lots of people were killed. And it's, it's history today. You can read about it in, in public sources. Well, and it's a nightmare, uh, the story of what Russian soldiers did in our territories. They just took uh, small babies uh, by their legs and they uh, hit uh, uh, their heads against the walls uh, while laughing. I believe no people should experience anything similar anymore. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for this contribution. Next uh, two speakers. Unfortunately, we have uh, uh, very limited time, so I, I kindly ask you to, to introduce yourself at the beginning of your presentation and try to be very brief, my kind. Request Mr. Stanislav Suswov first. Thank you very much. Dear colleagues, thank you for the chance to speak on important questions. The Russian world is a concept that has recently taken on alarming importance. The reason of, is the brutal aggression of the so-called Russian Federation on independent Ukraine. The Russian world today has a similar ideology to fascism, of one national superiority over others. I was, it was uh, the 
fascist ideology of the Russian world that drove uh, the direct military aggression against Ukraine. In the same way, the Russian world is destroying national differences inside in the so-called Russian Federation. Moscow ignores the drunkenness, drug use, and aggressive insert uh, the native peoples on the occupation territories. Moscow ignores the terrible HIV epidemic that is killing the population of the so-called Russian Federation. The United Nations classifies this as a genocide. Genocide, genocide is being carried out both outside the borders of the so-called Russian Federation and inside it. The Russian world is irrational and like a parasite, it will be die in the end. At present, the only ambition of the Russian world is to keep alive all the war criminal leader Putin and his friends. The growing agony we are already seeing in the Russian world will end in disintegration. I would like, therefore, to draw the attention of the European Parliament to two important questions that we have discussed in previous forums, and also an important message which I will say at the end of my speech. The first of the question of security, the security of nuclear weapons, of nuclear objects, and of public safety in the creation of the new independent countries in the post-Russian space. Optionally, they could be done by using, elite, using elites in power, in, power, in power structures in the regions to provide order and security at the start of the formation of independent countries. What guarantees and what guarantees can the elites get for this? The second question is uh, developing a handout of passports from the new independent countries as soon as possible. Uh, so, uh, the question of security. In our previous forums, we have discussed the constancy of the current regional borders. The solution will provide security from regional conflicts on a territorial basis. To secure nuclear objects, objects and weapons, as well as public order, it is proposed to temporarily using, uh, use existing elites in the initial time. A few words about the elites in the so-called Russian Federation. All the elites in the regions are installed from Moscow. But, the, uh, but that doesn't mean that they are ideologically committed to the Russian world. The rhetoric, the speeches, is not an idea but a job for money. Mind you, I'm talking about the elites in the regions. Where they see the frailty of the center, they will look out option, options to keep their money and security uh, for themselves. They will gladly sell our, uh, their bosses if they understand that they can keep their money and their uh, lives. One thing to offer even now is to inform the elites that they have the only chance to keep in their money and get an amnesty from the tribunal. But to do so, they, uh, they want to provide control of the military and police uh, in the regions. And they want to provide security for nuclear objects and weapons, as well as public order. And they want to agree that they will not be able to take part in the future government elections and structures. They must start preparing for the democratic elections in the region and start cooperation with the temporary international control. Temporary international control will work as an advisor to the organization of democratic procedures and nuclear uh, dismantling. And question number two. There is already a worldwide practice to use in passports of some countries to citizens of other countries, do citizenship and more. The use of, the, of such passport could begin, begin after the adopting of a declaration of regional sovereignty. It will be good if the sovereignty of the new countries is the first accepted by the countries that have borders with the so-called Russian Federation. Having a Siberian Confederation of free Tatarstan passport will allow holders of this passport to participate in the referendums and elections. This is very important uh, for the process. I'm talking about the first point. Uh, 
For the first time, passports can be handed out outside the territory of the so-called Russian Federation. I would like to point uh, point out, point out uh, that this is not a uh, so-called uh, good Russian passport. I'm only talking about the passport of a citizen of a country that will be liberated from the Moscow center occupation. I would like to say that both questions are very important and it is uh, uh, impossible to talk about all the details in a small period of time. This question need be detail with the analytics experts and the working groups with the European Union and maybe other international bodies. A resolution of this important question will help to protect everyone from the uh, aggressive Russian world as quickly as possible. When the aggressive Russian world ends, the following world problems will disappear. First, the global source of military danger. Two, the dirty money cleaning, money cleaning, cleaning, cleaning center. Three, a major center of global corruption. Four, center of propaganda against democracy and progress. Five, the problems of Balkans region and resolution of possible questions. Six, a dictatorships of Iran in North Korea will disappear. And seven, military conflicts in Africa territory will stop. If we don't stop it now, the aggressive empire will rise again from the dark. Wars that one we see now after the collapse of the USSR. But it is not only the regions of Russia that are occupied by the so-called Russian Federation. My colleague Chedemir Stoikovich will talk about uh, in the next panel in our forum today. And dear colleges, you can find the full text of my speech in a promotional materials in our time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed. Apologies for, for, for a short time of contribution. The last speaker of this panel is Artyom Tarasov. Uh, please introduce yourself at the very beginning, the representation. Um, dear participants, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm Adam Tarasov. Uh, I am legal researcher and uh, humanitarian worker um, with refugees. And um, I'm glad to welcome supporters of independence of different lands <clears throat> and nations. I'm glad to see free people here. And I'm also glad to see representatives of European states, uh, politicians and public figures. I want to welcome you and thank you for being here and for communicating with us. Uh, <clears throat> I represent the supporters of the independence uh, of the Pskov land. Uh, for us, the, th the subject of our event, and in particular the first panel, is very, very relevant. Um, major historical events are taking place uh, before our very eyes. <clears throat> The Russian <clears throat> Empire is uh, waging another war of aggression. And the victorious country and its allies will decide what they want, what they want uh, Russian territory, Russian's territory to be. And now I want to address European politicians. Uh, many people tell you that you should be afraid of the so-called uh, collapse of Russia. And they tell you that it is possible, and even if it is possible, it must be prevented. Uh, those uh, who, uh, who say that I are wishing you and your country's harm. They want a monster living near your eastern border that they will put to sleep for a while, but that sleep will not last forever. This monster used to extend as far as uh, East Germany. Now almost all of the Eastern European states are free. Has that made it worse? Uh, has there been a collapse? So why should it happen now where the new post-Russian states join the European family? Uh, the problem is that the Russian system, the imperial ideology, persists for all of Russia's 
internal transformations. Uh, changing the flag over the Kremlin will not fundamentally change the essence of Russian statehood. Um, so the catastrophic position of the Pskov, the my land, um, uh, as part of Russia did not change with the change of Tsars and regimes. Uh, because the empire does not care about the invaded territories. It is just a senseless conquest. Uh, this did not even begin with the Ivan the Terrible, but earlier, uh, when the Moscow princes uh, began making uh, plans to enslave their neighbors. Um, no one talks about it, but uh, at the time, our land, I mean the Pskov Republic, had borders and army laws, and it was a separate state. It was a completely different system from Moscow. And um, we were some of Russia's first victims. And as we can see, Russia has not stopped to, to, this, to, to this day. Uh, uh, continuing the conquest for over 500 uh, years. And that does not mean that we are su su uh, suggesting uh, a return to the past. But we have to build the future and stop imperialism. We are not just thinking of ourselves, we are thinking of Europe and uh, of the world. Solving this problem will require great effort, but victory in this struggle will be beneficial to all of uh, Eastern Europe and Europe in, 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 in common. Uh, Pskov is a region that is on the border with Latvia, Estonia and Belarus. Therefore, it is important to say especially to the representatives of these states, uh, we have recently issued a statement in which we pointed out that the Pskov Republic must become free, break with the Russian uh, past forever and go to the West, to its origins, to its European brothers, uh, with, for, with whom it was separated, having been kidnapped from the European family and given into the Moscow captivity. Estonians, uh, Latvians, Belarusians, Lithuanians, and other peoples and nations, we want to live with you uh, with friendship and, co and cooperation. Our peoples have lived side by side for centuries, trading and cooperating with each other. Uh, we have many mixed marriages where there are uh, Pskov people, Estonians, Latvians, Belarusians, and so on. Uh, we are connected by a common geographic region, historical and cultural ties. And we are convinced that our aspirations are useful and beneficial for you too. Uh, freeing a neighboring region from an imperial mindset, mindset is a difficult task. That's, uh, that is why we need cooperation with our neighbors. For our part, we call on the countries of Eastern Europe in particular to join the discussion on political autonomy of the Pskov land and other lands of Northwest Russia. We are convinced that, uh, that uh, contact with European partners on this uh, issue should be led by people who do not associate associate them, themselves with Russia and who are ready to take responsibility for creating a secure and strong Baltic region. We are convinced that it is better to develop our land together, no empire, no Russian bases, uh, no treats. Our independence will benefit the whole Baltic region as well as the whole of Europe. Uh, together, Together, we will uh, strengthen our Baltic Sea region. It will expand eastwards, and the problem of the imperial treat will be solved forever. So, so the question of the independence of the Pskov Republic and other border regions is not about possible or not possible. It is about necessary. It is necessary for Pskov itself and necessary for its neighbors. 
and know that we will do our best for it. Thank you for your attention. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that concludes uh, the first panel. Let me uh, uh, let us all join in in applauding all distinguished speakers. Uh, I consider this panel particularly interesting. So, thank you, thank you very much indeed. We have to quickly rearrange the podium, so please stay. It will take just a couple of minutes. Uh, my uh, colleague Kosma Złotowski uh, takes uh, moderating of this panel, and I invite next panelists.
и в прямом эфире мы идем. Мало слов тогда вообще, кто организатор, какую цепку следует. Представьте себе это. Мы просто помогаем, мы спикнулись со организатором этого мероприятия. Нам тоже интересен сам процесс. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, we have rather time shortage, so we should uh, slowly begin the next panel. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. We should begin our panel. There is rather time shortage, so we should begin. Can we? Well, so let's start. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, I am Kosma Zeldowski. I am a member of the European Parliament. Um, I am co-worker um, of uh, Mrs. Anna Fotiga, who, is organized, uh, uh, who has organized uh, this uh, conference. Uh, I am a member of uh, Peace Party, uh, the ruling party in Poland now, and a member of ECR uh, group in the European Parliament. Well, we have a war, and the war that Russia has declared on Ukraine and the entire democratic world has tragic consequences for all of us, but including its residents. 
Of course, certain privileged groups are able to avoid participating in the fighting and enjoy relative normalcy. But for hundreds of thousands of citizens of the Russian Federation, it is a brutal reality sweetened by propaganda only. Can this conflict lead to the dis disintegration of the relic of colonialism that Russia is? World prize are ethnic minorities and regions far from Moscow and St. Petersburg paying for the war. The answer, I hope, we will get from our guest, to whom I'm giving the floor. Uh, please, uh, uh, dear panelists, uh, introduce you, yourself uh, shortly, and uh, I hope it will be a fruitful uh, discussion. Our first panelist is Mr. Andrius Almanis. You have the floor. Thank you. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to my presentation. I'd like, first of all, uh, thank organizers of this meeting uh, for inviting me here, and let thank uh, you all uh, being here. Uh, I am uh, president of the uh, Institute of post Russia Regions and uh, a member of the uh, Committee of uh, Independent uh, Siberia Confederation. And I will uh, tell you about four options. Ah, switched, okay. Four options of post Russia, but all of them are with the same result independent new states, no other result. Uh, First option, the best option. Uh, it is the shortest way, uh, shortest way uh, with, with least loss is maximum support uh, from the democratic world for the regions and the new states. In this case, uh, Russia's military defeat will be followed by the guaranteed collapse of the current Kremlin regime, then followed by the guaranteed strengthening of centrifugal forces. The regions or some regions will become independent states, the regions or some regions. Uh, and best case scenario, the new states will have sufficient support from the democratic world. After this, stability and democracy will prevail in this region of the world. Option two. Uh, not sufficient support. Uh, it, it, sadly, it's a um, quite realistic scenario, but I uh, hope um, we will go, go with the first scenario. That's why, because I, I'm talking about it. The new states will not get sufficient support, in this case, from the democratic world. Uh, most of uh, new states, if chose, will um, appear will become again authoritarian, and as a result, a reanimation of the empire is guaranteed. Then again, concentration of forces will take place, and again, new wars. Then the whole democratic world will mobilize at last, because it will once again face an existential threat. Again, there will be the military defeat of Russia, then again, the collapse of the Kremlin regime, and again, the guaranteed strengthening of centrifugal forces, regions or some regions again will become independent states, and finally, the democratic world will return back to the real power of democracy and decide to give sufficient, finally, sufficient support to the new states. You see, same result. То есть, видите, результат будет такой же. Think uh, two circles or maybe more, with much more victims. Option three, survival. Oh, back. Option three, survival of the current Kremlin regime, also possible. After freezing of the current situation, what, what is uh, sadly but possible, survival. Then again, concentration and forces, and again, new wars. And then finally, military defeat of Russia. Then again, collapse of the Kremlin regime, strengthening of centrifugal forces, and we are going to the same result. 
uh, establishing of new states, and finally stability and democracy will prevail in, in this world region. But what price? Option four. Uh, option of united democratic Russia. Um, democratic or rather semi or even pseudo democratic Russia. Perhaps this is even the most dangerous op option because in this case the wish to support the democratic regime of a new united Russia will guarantee it lead back to the renovation of the empire and again to the new wars. Why? It is simple. After the military defeat of Russia, there will be collapse of the Kremlin regime, then will appear a united semi-democratic Russia, and after that, guaranteed fall back to the empire and back to the new wars. You will say, this renovation of empire does not have to happen, but do you remember what was the end of Yeltsin's Russia? Does the world want to repeat same mistakes again and again? So, in order to avoid same circle and guarantee new wars and a huge number of victims, the democratic world must prepare right now for the guaranteed collapse of the current Russian regime and the establishment of new states. And the democratic world must right now support uh, independent democratic organizations and movements in the regions of present-day Russia. After the guaranteed crash of the current Russian regime, one. Ah, okay. One, direct relations with the regions, especially with democratic. Two, plan for the democratization of regions. Three, very important, support only in exchange for democratization. Uh, of course, the reparation plans, constant control over the, those plans, the imperialization plan, ideas for each uh, region, and investment plans and programs for each region. Thank you for attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Almanis. And, uh, and now we have uh, a voice from Moscow Republic, remotely, Mr. Ilya Lazarenko. Thank you. I'm very happy to uh, speak uh, at this panel. So we are talking about uh, uh, Russian, Russia's attack on Ukraine and its consequences. I will say a few words about how it is perceived in Russian regions. The war against uh, Ukraine and Russian attack on this country led to two very curious trends. And those trends are fortunately well, quite a unique combination. We see that a lot of people support this aggression. And for a lot of people, this war is a war for Russia. So the stacks are high and Russian propaganda is openly speaking about this. So the stakes are our ultimate victory or our ultimate defeat psychologically is very important because it means that a Russian defeat in this country will have very big uh, moral and psychological consequences for Russian people. And the second trend is uh, distancing from the state. The war is perceived as something strange as an activity by the government and the state is perceived as well something hostile to 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 a person so for us it is very important to take this into account because when we have russian defeat in the future 
So we will have to face the consequences. We will see a lot of Russian patriots who will be disillusioned, who who will understand that, well, it's the end of Russian history that what they have been told by Russian propaganda on the, on the other side... It will, there will be a fight for independence from the imperial center. So those two trends are very important if we want to think about future Russia and future states on the Russian space. It's a paradox, but the war against Ukraine leads to more distance between center and the regions among those who think they are Russians. We are move further and further away from Ukraine and the Ukrainians and from the rest of the world. And that's why it's a paradox, but the regions start to perceive themselves as an entity, Russian ideologists and Putin affirm that Russia has no borders, like every empire, but in fact we see that those borders do exist, and quite soon we will see that those borders are not only along Russian perimeter, but we also have borders inside Russia. In some time, it will be obvious that Tatars is a separate people, as Ukraines are, as lots of peoples inside Russia are. So this process of distancing, of separating of the Russian nation, of the center and of the regions, will lead us towards understanding that it's important to create in on the territory of Russia well a separate state for for the Russian people so after the collapse of the Russian empire this state will be, will become necessary it will be sort of a refuge state for the Russian people and would like to make a small comment on the previous uh, speech, of course, we don't see any option for a free democratic Russia of the future. Russia is by itself a continental theocratic empire, and it can't be rebuilt. Russian political culture, Russian state culture are imperialistic, are Eurasian, and of course, Russia can't become a democratic, free state. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Speaker comes from Kubain, Mr. Evgenios Bursanidis. You have the floor. Yeah. Good afternoon for everyone. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, delegates and uh, deputies of Euro Parliament, I brought a message from uh, the part of uh, Europe which is occupied by Russia for one hundred, more than five, 100 years because uh, the forming of uh, Kuban People's Republic, uh, Kubanska Narodna Respublika, uh, formed at uh, 28th of uh, January. 1918 and uh, after two years of existence it was occupied by Russia. So uh, let us um, uh, bring you a fast uh, topic. So our land is uh, ancient and uh, civilization in the region began to develop uh, even in Bronze Age after for example the Dolmen culture and um, a lot of peoples like uh, as, uh, ancient Greeks, Romans and uh, else and for sure the predecessors of uh, our days Circassians which is the local population 
uh, left a mark at uh, uh, Cuban. Also, the development of uh, this territory in European style, in European way, continued at uh, <coughs> uh, medieval times, at Middle Ages. Ages and um, the, that was the dynamically growth of trading because of um, connections, for example, between Circassians and the uh, Ottoman Empire, also uh, Byzantians, Genoese and other peoples passed over this territory. So, uh, as well, the first presence of uh, Ukrainians, in, uh, of predecessors of Ukrainians in Kuban, marked at uh, 11th and 12th century, when the principality of Tmut Arakan emerged at uh, uh, southeast of uh, modern Kuban, or modern Krasnodarsky Krai, which uh, uh, a lot of people know it in Europe. So, as well, uh, the next uh, uh, pass of uh, the next emergence of uh, uh, Ukrainians in the territory of Kuban marked it uh, after 1775 after the devastation and deportation of the Cossacks from the Parisian siege uh, and the first uh, uh, settlements of Cossacks it was about 47 uh, settlements uh, named Stanitsa uh, formed at 1792-1794, uh, uh, giving birth to Cuban-Ukrainian mentality and culture, uh, and uh, given to the region the character of parts of Ukrainian uh, cultural space first time after uh, Tmutarakan Principality. So, in the uh, 19th century, uh, century, Ukrainian culture with local Cuban flavor was the dominant in Kuban, although it did not prevent Russian authorities from exerting constant pressure, especially on Ukrainian language, Ukrainian mentality, Ukrainian traditions, Ukrainian literature, and else. Uh, because um, uh, it uh, was uh, told enough about uh, the terrible crime of uh, Russian Empire, the Circassian genocide. Um, I just want to add that only at the last stage of this genocide, uh, from uh, 500,000 uh, uh, up to 1 million people were killed at 1,864 and deported, uh, the survivors were deported, you know, to Ottoman Empire. The next genocide, which uh, was played out as a great drama in the territory of Kuban, was the genocide of Cossacks and another groups of uh, Cuban Ukrainians also, and another peoples which uh, were, which populated Kuban, uh, were uh, suffered during the period of 20s and 30s of uh, the past century. So as well, uh, the chance for freedom uh, began, became at uh, uh, 1980 when Cuban People's Republic, Kumanska Narona Respublica, was formed. And I thanks from the, all the bottom of my, my, my heart Mr. Ahmed Zakai for mentioned the Gorska Respublika because it was the first state that recognized Cuban People's Republic and it was the first state of which the uh, connections and conversation and diplomatic attitudes were established between Gorska Respublika and Kubanska Narona Respublika. Also, after two years of struggle, Cuban was reoccupied. Also, there was an idea, which I want to mention too, to made a kind of federation or confederation of Ukraine. And I want to mention that uh, at least at the part of uh, uh, people who support the uh, restore of uh, uh, Cuban independence and uh, Cuban state, uh, this idea is not dead yet. Especially after the fall of Cuban People's Republic, uh, began the genocide. Also, uh, uh, 
the Holodomor. I uh, can mention also that uh, the um, reoccupation of Kubain was uh, made, was done in a very terrible way as Russia does, uh, uh, as Russia acts usually. And for example, after uh, the delegation in the uh, Cyrus uh, Peace Conference, which uh, finished the World War I, the delegates were uh, caught by the imperialists uh, in Kuban, in head of uh, Alexei Kulabukhov, and they were hanged in Kuban. Also, during the negotiations in Rostov on Don, at um, uh, 14th of uh, June 1919, uh, one of the heads of independence Kuban and one of the main ideologist, Mikolai Rebovil, was killed uh, mainly at the back. He was shot at the back during the negotiations. So one more crime. As well, uh, there was uh, also the great opposition. Uh, for example, uh, it's honorable to mention the COPA, Kozatka Povstanska Armia, which was uh, uh, acting at uh, the region up to 1,952. Uh, so uh, then, after this uh, part of uh, Cuban uh, uh, struggle for independence and for freedom, the new uh, tendencies uh, grew up and began after 2014. So, it doesn't mean that it was forgotten, because um, uh, Cuban all the time had a very big part of um, self-determination. For example, uh, one of the governors of Cuba, Nikolai Kondratenka, or Batka Kondrat, how we call him, uh, maintained diplomatic relations with Ichkeria and personally with Aslan Mashadov, the president of Ichkeria. And uh, a representational office of Ichkeria was opened in Krasnodar. Also, he opposed the Russian claim on Tuzla at uh, 90s and uh, at uh, uh, 2005 opposed the Russian trade sanctions against Moldova. So the year uh, 2040 changed many things and remember their Ukrainian roots, many locals turned to ideas of independence. In uh, 2014, in Krasnodar, the authorities practically cut it at the birth of March for the federalization of Kuban. At uh, 2050, Mikhail Kalamin architecture from Sochi, I organized the movement Free Cuba, and in 2019, in Cuban diaspora, in exile, uh, Malinovic Klin, our organization was created by me and Dmitro Dorovskich. So as well, uh, the, I can mention that the fate of um, architecture Mikhail Kalamin was tragically because at August of uh, 2020 uh, after uh, uh, 21 after six months of persecution by Russian secretary services including the use of punitive psychiatry the activist heart failed thus in our struggle for independence we have suffered some really losses uh, as well uh, the crime of war against Ukraine is the most terrible crime, but not the only crime from Russia. So uh, the meaning is the same. Like as about 100 years before, Ukrainians from Kuban are killing Ukrainians from big Ukraine. And it's the terrible fact. It's really the terrible fact. So not everyone from them is so poisoned with Russian propaganda that they forgot their roots. Uh, we know a lot of people who fight in Ukrainian ranks against the Russian aggression, who came from the third countries to Ukraine and joining the forces, the armed forces of Ukraine. Unfortunately, they are fewer than um, uh, the people who doesn't remember about their roots and uh, have a great level of russification, but anyway, this process uh, with uh, uh, 
the good uh, terms uh, can have a way back. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, for sure, the um, uh, defeat of Russian forces in this aggressive war uh, will influence the, not only defeat but the collapse of the empire and that's why the first thing we met here I use to remind one more time and I fix it in my uh, text here uh, firstly uh, in the moment the Ukrainian soldiers are dying on the war France defending our calmness and Russian bombs and missiles are killing civilians, women, children and uh, the elderly. Therefore, whatever we do here, first of all, remember that to defeat Moscow on the battlefield, we need two components. New, even tougher sanctions against Russia, complete isolation of Russia as a country, forcing the aggression out of the old world markets. The second component is the better investment in the world in the peace tomorrow, for tomorrow's peace. More high precision, powerful, modern weapons for Ukraine every day. More weapons for Ukraine, more support for Ukraine. Stand with Ukraine. This is the main thing, because this war, for sure, um, will uh, uh, make closer the empire's collapse. As well, in Euro we know the opinion is popular that um, the collapse of uh, Russia can uh, uh, also uh, give an impulse for uh, any dangerous processes all over the Eurasia. But the aggressive attack of Russia uh, proves the another thing that uh, the Russia is more dangerous and uh, provides more threats for all countries around and for all civilized world in the form of empire. This was how the things were, and this is how the things are. Nevertheless, uh, as well and as the parts of the things uh, that I want to add about the activities of Malino Wiklin. For sure we provide help for Ukraine, for sure we uh, provide information about our existence, catching this time the activists at the place, I mean at Kuban, we are fixing our contacts with the activists' uh, rights in the territory of uh, uh, Krasnodar Krai of Kubain, and as well, uh, I want to add that uh, uh, another um, another thing that I want to add about this is uh, another decision for Krasnodar Krai. So we. Uh, I think that in view of the historical and cultural ties and bearing the mind the attempt to create a confederation of Cuba and Ukraine at uh, 1919, we also see not only as acceptable but one of the best options, the possible joining Ukraine on a federal or confederal basis. Time will tell which route is the best, independence or become the part of Ukraine. I think that for Cuban it's one of the good and very possible ways. Uh, so, uh, as well, the existence of Cuban, of modern Krasnodar Krai, as part of Ukraine or as independent state, will uh, give a situation of win-win for all the sides of um, free world, of Western world. Uh, our uh, region is very rich. It's marked of, by wealth of resources and enormous potential for development. Cuban covers uh, uh, 
three uh, climatic zones, temperate, continental, semi-dry, Mediterranean and subtropical, and the range of crops that can be grown in the region are very wide. And its agricultural potential is unique. The region is rich in resources that can be grown in the region uh, and uh, uh, full of the resources. There are about 150 oil and gas producers, and in 2020, new oil fields were discovered near Slavensk on Kubain, the uh, potential of which has not yet been fully explored, possibly some of the largest in Europe. The ports of Azov and Black Seas, uh, Primorsk, Akhtarsk, Tamany, Anapa, Novorossiysk, Topse, and my mother city, Sochi, have, yes, for sure, uh, have enormous potential for trading and tourism. And the tourism, thanks to the climate, unique nature and rich history is also one of the uh, most important sources of income. So we have a great potential to become, or the part of Ukraine, either a great, free, democratic, independent state. Also, I want to uh, finish uh, uh, my words, my message, with the words I mentioned before in other sessions of the forum that uh, we don't uh, see Cuban as the mono-ethnic entity. We want to base our entity of coexistence with Circassians, Cossacks and another peoples that populate our land now. Thank you very much everyone for this platform. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bustanidis. Both ways you have shown us uh, are welcome here. And now uh, I will give the floor to Mr. Andrei uh, Sidelnikov. You have the floor. Yeah, thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank all the organizers uh, who invited me to such uh, necessary and timely conference. Uh, I'm a political immigrant, so I have been living uh, outside, outside of Russia for more than 13 years, uh, but I'm still involved to the, all the problems and life uh, in Russia. I'm Russian, and I think I, I will continue uh, my speech in Russian. I'm also representative of uh, Russian uh, deputies, uh, uh, head of secretariat. The full-scale invasion in Ukraine on 24th of February last year, uh, in my opinion, is leading towards inevitable collapse of the Russian Empire. It's obvious for me that after Ukrainian victory, Russia, in its present form, will cease to exist. Well, in any case, its borders will not be the same as in 1991. And it's quite obvious for me. And uh, it's not only my wish. I think that all those processes have been triggered by Vladimir Putin, a Russian dictator and usurpator. And he has been uh, leading in this direction for the last uh, 20 years. There are different reasons uh, for this disintegration of Russia. On one side, of course, it's uh, the fact that there is no freedoms uh, and rights, no democratic institutions, well, unfair distribution of money between the regions. Uh, and I'm not even talking about the fact that uh, there is no political uh, ground, uh, no political pluralism, no political parties, no political activities in Russia for the past several years. It's just a simulator. It's just, you know, it has nothing to do with the reality. And we do understand today that uh, Russia cannot be considered as a part of a big and civilized family today. The main reason of this disintegration of Russia 
is uh, the beginning of the full-scale aggression, uh, even that the war started in 2014 with the annexation of Crimea, then the Donbas, uh, then before that in Georgia, and before that Chechnya. Wars, uh, and that shows the example uh, for other peoples of Russia who want to fight for their freedom, that there is a really long way to go. And uh, of course, Mr. Zakayev is doing everything, and he's here today uh, at this conference. Uh, and all the everything that uh, the people, so people of each carrier, da, everything that people of each carrier do today uh, is just great. I mean, other peoples will have to take an example from them in order to free themselves from Russia. And I think it's uh, the best historical moment for the Russian peoples to become free, independent. Well, we need to, need to understand that independence is a big responsibility as well. Uh, in order to be fully active and uh, fully free and fully enjoy the rights, uh, it's not easy. As especially if this region who will become free, which will become free, will border a region which will not become free. The, the fight for independence uh, is, uh, is the right thing to do and uh, is a cause of right. And all these enslaved peoples of Russia, if they become independent, it will be great for their future and, and and for the freedom. From May 2022, I live in Kiev. I uh, go often uh, to the front line and I help uh, the all these people who live in the deoccupied territories and uh, if uh, our visions are different about the future of Russia, I think we have to forget about this, this uh, differences, and we have to do everything in order for Ukraine to win, for the Ukrainian nation, for the Ukrainian state, to help them with the allies to free from the f fascism, the territory the ca that came with this Putin's aggression, hundred years later. We need to do everything as much as possible in order to help Ukraine win. And it will mean that all the peoples that who live uh, even in Russia will win as well. It will bring them the civilized war, uh, civilized uh, peace, sorry. And uh, the future of all of us depend on the victory of Ukraine. And that's why I appeal to everyone who is here in this room to do everything possible to help the Ukrainian nation, the Ukrainian army, and to all of us together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We all think that Ukraine will win. I want to give the floor to Mr. Pavel Messerim from India. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, I'm Pavel Mizelin from St. Petersburg. Uh, I think you know about St. Petersburg, St. Petersburg City. Uh, I'm coordinator of civil movement uh, Free India, and I will speak about uh, St. Petersburg in uh, post-Russia, or maybe St. Petersburg after Russia. So, ladies and gentlemen, our European colleagues, Russia, the last empire on earth, has completed, exhausted its historical potential. Gone are the British, French, German, Ottoman and all the other empires. Only Russia remains an empire, a prison of colonized people and region. The age of empires ended in the last century. And now we are all observing how many troubles an empire that has survived in the 21st century can bring to people. We, representatives of the people and regions of Russia, have come to you to tell you something that you may not know. 
Russia is not a single monolithic country, as serious uh, communist leaders and today Vladimir Putin have always tried to imagine. All regions of Russia are very different. They have different history, different culture, different language and dialects. And I'm not just talking about regions with ethnical different population. I'm also talking about the regions where Russians live. Russians in Kaliningrad, in St. Petersburg, in Moscow, Kuban, and Siberia are all very different Russians. And they all want freedom. And they all deserve freedom. Russians do not need the Russian Empire. Please help Russians create their new independent Russian states. I have come to Brussels to tell you about the hope for a free future for the people of magnificent St. Petersburg, the capital of the Ingermanland region, Ingria, which now bears the ridiculous communist name of uh, Leningrad Oblast. The level of support from the residents of St. Petersburg and Leningrad region for the idea of self-sufficiency and independence from Moscow was always high. This includes both Soviet and post-Soviet period of the region history. April 25, in 1993, along with the all-Russian referendum, population survey was conducted about the promotion of St. Petersburg status to the level of a republic within the Russian Federation. 75 persons of citizens voted for. Initially, a full-scale referendum was planned uh, instead for a of a survey, yet it turned impossible for legal reasons. Uh, according to Russian law, its use of such a level already at that time were not allowed to be put uh, to a referendum by the decision of local authorities. The current political processes in St. Petersburg region of the Russian Federation are very reminiscent of a similar procession in the Baltic countries, Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia. On the eve of the First World War and the collapse of the Russian Empire, were barely noticeable outside people's organizations and movements for three decades were setting the stage for obtaining national independence in, the, in the, our age. The political history of Ingria, or Ingermanland, goes back centuries to the days of the reign in Novgorod of the future Kiev, Ukrainian Prince Yaroslav the Wise. The region received its name in honor of Yaroslav's wife, the Swedish princess Ingegert. This period was the time of the first economic prosperity of the region through transit trade between Novgorod Republic and Sweden. In the following centuries, Ingria was part of uh, the Republic of Novgorod, Moscow, Sweden. As a result of the Northern War, it became part of Russia. At the location of Ingria capital, the city of Nienschanz, that was destroyed by war, Tsar Peter the Great founded St. Petersburg, which, uh, before becoming the capital of the Russian Empire, uh, became the center of Ingermanland province, which was uh, later uh, remained into St. Petersburg. During the Civil War, on the territory of modern Leningrad region, to the north of St. Petersburg, the independent Republic North Ingria was formed, which found uh, against the Bolshevik Russia. A nobleman and a white officer, uh, Georgi Elvengren, was the head of the Republic. He was the commander of the Northern Ingermanland Regiment that uh, fought against the Bolsheviks. In addition to the Northern South Ingermanland uh, Regiment, uh, also existed, which was striking at Petrograd, Petersburg, from Estonia. Karl Gustav Mannerheim, also an officer of the Russian Tsarist Army, uh, then president of the independent Finland, offered white General Yudenich to take the city together. Yet uh, the latter said that he supports he won and indivisible Russia and does not recognize the independence of Finland and Estonia, uh, not to mention Ingria. Independent North Ingria existed two years. Its state symbol was the flag of Ingermanland, Regime and the historical cost of arms of Ingria of Swedish times, which later became the chevron of in the Ingermanland uh, infantry regiment uh, formed by Peter the Great. According to the Tartu Peace Treaty of 1920, the territory of Ingria became part of the uh, uh, communist Russia. Raising the Ingrian flag over St. Petersburg was postponed by the history until better times. 
Ingria is a region with great touristic, uh, scientific, industrial and transit logistic potential. Even today, with all kinds of obstacles from the central Moscow authorities, authorities and uh, conducting and an independent foreign economic, uh, economic activity, the St. Petersburg region is one of the few Russian regions donors. At the same time, more than 80% of the income forcibly goes to Moscow into the so-called uh, federal uh, budget of the Russian Federation. Petersburg region is completely self-sufficient uh, from the economical point of view. In case Ingria gains the political and economic independence, it quickly enters the numbers of economically developed countries of Europe. Ingria should and will seek to join all international organizations that uh, would promote national independence and the international prestige of Ingria, first of which in the United Nations organization, uh, now United Nations organization. Furthermore, uh, taking uh, into account their historical experience and uh, cultural identity, the accession of Ingria to the European Union and the North Atlantic NATO military bloc is likely to be only a matter of time. Russians, uh, is a native, Russian is a native language for 90% of the region population. It is likely to become the official language of the country. Nevertheless, is considering the history of the region based on the principles of linguistic equality and tolerance, a law will be adopted on regional languages according to which in places of compact residence of representatives or relevant nationalities, the regional status with all their rights will be given to Finnish, Azorian, Vodian and uh, Vepsian uh, languages. The vast majority of Indian population is uh, ethnic Russian. The theoretics for uh, Ingerman land independence uh, regard Ingria is the so-called mm, the big St. Petersburg. Also, the majority of participants in the movement for the revival of Ingria insist that its territory includes both St. Petersburg and the entire current Leningrad region, without exception. St. Petersburg's population is 5 million residents, or Leningrad region 1.5 million inhabitants, of which 1 million is connected with St. Petersburg one way or another way. Petersburg local identity was established already in the period of the Russian Empire and has long been a fact. One of the uh, most popular uh, slogans uh, among supporters of Ingrian independence, Ingria is a country, uh, Petersburg is a nationality. So, St. Petersburg is one of the pearls of Europe. We have always been part of Europe geographically and culturally. In the time of the Tsars, uh, in the Soviet times and in the times of freedom in the 1990s. And today, we do not want to take part in the imperial wars of the Moscow Kremlin. We are against the war in Ukraine. Ukraine is part of Europe and St. Petersburg and Ingria are also part of Europe. We want to go home to Europe. Let us come home. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mazarin. And our next speaker comes from Austria, which has never been a part of Russia. Herr Fellinger, Sie haben das Wort. Thanks a lot, but we were occupied by Russia for 10 long years, and we have not forgotten how terrible that is. Yeah. Thanks a lot for this opportunity, Mr. Prime Minister, Mr. Member of the Parliament. I'm very grateful for this invitation to Oleg and his uh, team. This is a very historic conference and a very important opportunity and I think it will contribute to, to the improvement of uh, the history of the European continent with the freedom of all your nations. I would like to start to present myself. I'm Günther Fellinger from Austria, a neutral country, unfortunately, but we want to join NATO. I've initiated the Austrian People's Petition to uh, look for NATO membership. It's also very important in my committee to support the NATO membership of Kosovo, of Bosnia and also of Ukraine. This is the way to peace and also the European Union itself should be a member of the NATO alliance. This is very important. It's the only way because never forget this war is very much about this question and we don't have to concede. We must confront Russia. This is the way for victory. This is my first initiative and also the second one. 
if I yeah for Montenegro. Montenegro is very important for this conference. Please, all of you, you have to study the case of Montenegro. I appeal uh, to learn the history of Montenegro. It was 90 years occupied by Serbia. It's now a NATO member. It's now on the edge of to be the European Union. It has the euro as currency. So Montenegro is free and this is in NATO. And if Montenegro can be free and in NATO, why not Kuban? Why not Chechenia? So this is the role model. And this is important to study. I call also here in the European Parliament for the membership of Montenegro in the European Union in 2024, because, ladies and gentlemen, we have also competition. The Russian and also the unfortunate nationalist government in Serbia is fighting in Montenegro a rollback campaign. They are doing that in many countries with this information. So the faster we do enlargement of the Western Balkan countries, starting with Montenegro, the better is for the stability of Europe. That's very important. So please support Montenegro in the European Union. That's the strategic answer to the question to the Russian war. Now let's come to uh, 34 new um, countries instead of the Russian Federation. Strategically, ladies and gentlemen, we have always tried many things with Russia, like appeasement, buying energy from Russia, and it all failed. They still have attacked us. <laughs> they have started this terrible war in 2022. And Mr. Member of the Parliament, I say we cannot allow such a terrible and terrorist federation east of us to continue. It's no longer in our strategic interest. We have tried many things with Putin and with Russia in the last 100 years, but it led to this war. So having a big empire who potentially attacks us again, even when we now find some armistice maybe, but they might attack us again, and we always live in the, shad in the shadow of such a terrorist state, that's absolutely wrong. So we have to dismantle Russia and we have to support all your movements. This is very important for the coming future. How we organize it, I will explain it in detail. I have also a YouTube video about this because I don't want to be too long. But we have, of course, to de-recognize Russia and to diplomatically, economically, and in all aspects isolate Russia at the moment. And then we have to have a very concrete plan for how to support each of your countries and how to do that and how to turn you into uh, democratic, successful market economies and uh, that is the way inside the UN, of course, inside OSTE, the Council of Europe, and that's all, I think, the way which is very logically in the next moment. So I'm fully supporting the aims of this conference. I'm from Austria. We started a terrible war, the First World War. We attacked our friends from Serbia in 1914. And I want to apologize for this terrible crime. As a result, Austria was dismantled. Austria was dismantled. Let's look at the parallel. Russia has attacked Ukraine. It must be dismantled. That's the logic. Yeah? And Austria was like this, a very big empire. Now it's 10 new countries, better countries. And look at Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia was a socialist dictatorship. And everybody said it will be forever. And no, it's now seven new countries. And they all work much better. They are free, democratic, market economies. Many, some of them are in NATO already. All of them will be ultimately in NATO and in the EU. And this is the way, this is the role model. The dissolution of Yugoslavia is the role model for the dissolution of the Russian Empire in the future. And we all have to study that, to learn it, and to copy exactly this process. So, how it will be? The international community will not support you. America has not supported the end of the Soviet Union and has not supported the end of the Austrian Empire and has not supported uh, the end of Yugoslavia. Never forget, George Bush was going to Kiev and said no to, in the, uh, to independence of Ukraine. The chicken Kiev case. James Baker was going to Yugoslavia and said no to the breakup of Yugoslavia. And the foreign minister of America was until 1918 against the dissolution and the independence of Yugoslavia, Czech Republic and Czechoslovakia back then in 1918. But then some things changed. They decided to support and it was the United States of America which was the most ardent supporter then later of the new states in Central Europe, of, um, of uh, for example Czechoslovakia and others. So you have to change the public opinion in the United States. Everybody of you must study the biography of Mr. Masaryk. 
He was the leader to transform and to get the recognition of Czechoslovakia by the United States. So this um, biography, this uh, history, how he did it, how he changed American public opinion is absolutely critical information for everybody here. I'm not so much in favor of what they did in it, the Italians or the Romanians, so uh, I'm in favor of the breakup according to the Yugoslavian model, so along the Republic lines. This is, I think, the much better way, and we need a European political and stable economic framework for the new states to come. Here again, uh, Yugoslavia is the framework, and we have I have worked in many of the countries, like in Kosovo, Montenegro, Macedonia, and these are all working. We have a stable role model. Exactly this uh, way to provide economic and political and military stability for ex-Yugoslavian states, we can copy right now, right uh, there in uh, the ex-Russian uh, states, and it's working, and this is, must be based exactly like this. Yes, this is my slide. I have here George Bush. He was not uh, supporting uh, Ukraine, uh, you remember. Uh, here is the chicken Kiev speech. Uh. It was James Baker in Tirana, but he was not supporting. We were also, we made many mistakes. But ultimately, when it then came to the war, it was the Americans who supported Croatian freedoms. Uh, not forgot, yeah? They will change if you win the debate internally. Yeah, lessons for ex-Russia. It's of course important, and that's why this conference is so important, to prepare world opinion that it's totally normal to welcome the Prime Minister of Chechenia here in the European Parliament. <laughs> <laughs> this is completely normal. And also me, but everybody of us, we have to learn the name of the new states. It must be completely normal to know Ingria and uh, to know Königsberg and to know uh, Chechenia and Ingushetia and all the new... Even I cannot uh, by heart uh, say all the 34 and I want to apologize, <laughs> but I will learn them. And each of us has to be disciplined to learn all the states of the, the names of the new countries and to support them like Kuban, like Free Siberia. And this is a wonderful conference to exactly do that. So, because I'm an economist, I want to make very clear, we have to offer a stable economic framework for all the new countries. Because why the international diplomats and your American partners will say, no, 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 no. Why? Because they think it will be chaos and it will be disaster. So where to do it? First of all, we need to currency stability. A, a currency must be pegged to the euro, like they did it in the Baltics countries and in Bulgaria, in the framework of trade agreements with the European Union, like we have a DCFTA with Ukraine, this is so important. So the same stability in the customs, in the trade system, in the currency system must be offered. The stability as the membership in the Council of Europe, in the OSCD. So you have to make declarations of your new countries that you want immediately to be in the WTO, in the OSCD, that you are totally aware what the international responsibility of a new state is and that the framework will be provided and you can be as successful as Montenegro and Kosovo and that should be always on your lips and that's very important. Economics is very important in this case but also the political framework is very important. Russia was until recently in the Council of Europe so all your new countries can be in the Council of Europe in the OECD, and that will give already a lot of political stability in this project. Yeah. yeah, concrete steps I have outlined. Ultimately, it's all important, as our friend from Kuban has said, the victory of Ukraine. We have to arm Ukraine. I want to use this opportunity in the European Parliament to criticize the German government for sending only 14 tanks. We need 140 tanks not 14. Ukraine must be provided with enough tanks to win this war. It is a minimum of 300, which was demanded by President Zelensky. It's better to send 500. We have 2,000 tanks. If Ukraine wins this war, we don't need any tanks anymore in Europe because we all will be peaceful partners in Europe. But we need now to send enough tanks to Ukraine. And of course, we need also to send airplanes to Ukraine. It must be F-16s to Ukraine. And please, America, please, European Union, send the tanks and send the airplanes enough to liberate Mariupol this year, because we don't want to have a long war. We want to have a victory this year. And the liberation of Mariupol is essential for that. 
And here also, of course, the stability, because I'm an economist, I always mention, please, Ukraine, you have also not done everything right. Ukraine must be integrated in the mechanism of Southeastern European stability, in the Regional Cooperation Council, in the Central European Free Trade Agreement, and also to pack the currency to the euro, and also best to adopt the euro as it was done in Montenegro, as it was done in Kosovo. And again, I repeat, Everything we did, because I was also participating in these uh, activities in the 2000s, and now it's very important that we repeat the success of Montenegro and Kosovo stability, political framework and economic framework in all the new countries, and it starts in Ukraine. Good. Here I have uh, made uh, two important um, things. Some of you might not know what we did in Southeastern Europe, and I meet a lot of people in Ukraine. I lived four years in Ukraine, and there was some kind of cultural prejudices that Ukraine is much better than Southeastern Europe, and we don't have to learn from. I published so many articles, please learn from Montenegro and from Kosovo, and still today, Ukraine has not recognized Kosovo because they are afraid of uh, Putin abusing this argument again. And that's a big mistake. If we don't believe in our own principles, in our own mechanisms, yeah? if Ukraine, for example, doesn't follow Western foreign policy because they think we know better what to do in the Balkans, yeah? that's a big mistake. Yeah? So we have built up all these mechanisms. Dr. Busek, he is my great hero, the former deputy prime minister who led Austria into the European Union. He passed away this year, unfortunately, last year, and he was the stability-backed coordinator. So what we immediately need is a stability pact for the post-Russian world, like it was decided in 1999 for the Balkans. And this stability pact must, is already there, basically, with this institution. And this must be funded, and this must be supported. And here all the new states must be integrated immediately, because all this mechanism exists. Yeah? No need to invent anything. I'm calling again here in the European Parliament. It was one of the biggest mistakes to have Eastern partnerships separated from the Balkan process. Yeah? <laughs> as if this would be different things. Uh, there is only one European Union, there is only one NATO, you all want to join us? Yes, let's join together. And if we can do the integration of the Eastern Partnership countries into this mechanism and then in the EU and NATO, that's of course the same mechanism for all the new countries which will develop out of the terrorist uh, federation once it's defeated. How it will be defeated? Very shortly here as well. The role model of ex-Yugoslavia is decisive. Of course, I cannot see in the future, <laughs> but I can say what happened. It happened exactly. First, there was an armistice basically by the defeat uh, of Serbia and of Milosevic in 1999 by the Western intervention. Sorry, there will be no Western intervention, but by Ukraine, of course, to have a defeat of Russia. And then it was the withdrawal of the Russian troops, in that case of the Serbian groups, uh, troops from Kosovo in the armistice of 99. And then Milosevic, because theoretically it was a democracy, he had to do fake elections, or he was normal elections, but he had to stuff it because he had a defeat. <laughs> and then uh, it was uh, so faked, the elections, and I'm talking about the 2024 elections of Putin. And there will be so much uh, ballot stuff uh, because that's what he will do for sure. He will maybe have a theoretical victory, but then it's the moment of revolution. Then it's the moment to prepare for a big uprising. At least it worked exactly that way with Mrs. Albright's support in the case of Serbia. And on the 5th of October, as you know very much, we have a representative from the October group here from Serbia. It's also time for a new revolution there. But on the 5th of October 2000, Milosevic was toppled. And let's think about the scenario of Putin's fall in 2024 by the spring, a Russian spring leading not to a free and democratic Russia, because that's a fallacy we have to fight, but to the independence of 34 new states who will be then supported by the West to be modern market democracies. And that's what we can learn from Yugoslavia. And I think that's a powerful, positive vision. And I say again, Montenegro is free, and so you will be free. Croatia is free, and so you will be free. Kosovo is free, and so you will be. And Ukraine is free and will win this war, and so you also will be free. And we will all win together. And that's basically my proposal, you know, to turn big, bad empires into good, small, modern market democracies. And I think that's what we should support intensively here from the European Parliament and the European institutions. And in conclusion, 
I have also a podcast. I'm again, of course, you know, allow me, I'm again promoting Austrian NATO membership because that uh, I need a lot of support. It's not so easy. And also Kosovo, Bosnia and Ukraine. And here, this is my webpage and my, my podcast, my YouTube channel. And I would also stream this video and a lot of... И на YouTube все стриминг также ведется. Очень много всего мы делаем на моем канале. Слава Украине и спасибо за внимание. Thank you very much, Mr. Feilinger. Our next guest is uh, unfortunately unpresent, Mr. Pavlo Klinkin, uh, foreign, uh, uh, former foreign minister of Ukraine. So uh, we have uh, time for discussion. If there are some questions to our guest, please, the floor is to you. Yes? so much thank you so much for this very interesting panel discussion i must say it's quite a rare opinion that i hear here in the european union i'm a ukrainian so it was really interesting to see this point of view and the question i wanted to ask is that today russia federation is uh, one of the biggest countries with the nuclear weapons so the question is if uh, we look at the scenario where we can uh, like make a lot of countries from the Russian Federation, what should we do with the nuclear weapon arsenal that is currently in Russian Federation and that is actually the their threat that they usually use here in their narratives to threaten European countries? Thank you so much. Well, this is a very good question because uh, uh, this uh, red uh, button is the one difference between Habsburg Empire <laughs> and Russian Empire today. Um, and, uh, well, we should ask after, uh, after the, uh, the, what we should do with, the, with this uh, weapons after Russian falls or before, before we can do nothing. The answer? Hmm? Yeah. You know, it's a bit exaggerated, the fear of the Russian nuclear weapons, because the basic principle is always that deterrence and mutually assured uh, destruction works. I was raised as a young person in the Cold War in Austria. It was always like this. We learned it in school and we learned it in politics, you know. It's always clear, you know, they destroy us, we destroy them, we will destroy the whole world, so it will never happen. And our nuclear weapons, by the way, work. <laughs> and if the Russians work, we have to see. And we will never see it because it's an absolute disaster and it will not happen. So the fear is, of course, there and the fear we have to address. In the breakup of the Russian Federation, we will not attack Russia. Not get, don't get it wrong. I think it was very clear. Don't have any hopes of NATO military intervention or anything like this. Even for Ukraine, NATO is doing only the minimum in terms of military supply. So don't uh, think that this will happen. But what, it, what will happen is simply like it happened in the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was armed to the maximum with nuclear weapon and it fall apart peacefully into 15 new countries. And a similar process is easily manageable. Also, the Russian people want to live, so there is not this danger of escalation, nuclear size in any way given what will happen. The command will be very careful to keep the control, and so probably we will have a similar retrenchment, a kind of central Russian republic with a lot of nuclear arms, and there will be a lot of effort similar like to de-arm nuclear in Ukraine. There will be a transfer of the nuclear um, uh, weapons to this central new uh, core Russian state, and this is the most likely scenario to happen. And please don't leave any, leave any sleep about it, because the world will be safe. And again, the American nuclear weapons work for sure. Thank you very much. Yes, yes, optimism is this uh, what we need. Uh, yes? Can I say something about this question? Uh, about yes. this question. Thank you very much. I, I will be translated or not. I, I would like to say in, in Russian. Yes? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, why Putin started this war? Putin at Wainu Natural Imin. Putin started this war because he was sure of his uh, nuclear 
arms and the processes that we are discussing here today, the processes which will lead to Russian transformation, are internal processes in Russia. Of course, Ukraine or Europe uh, uh, don't involve themselves in Russian internal politics. But uh, when we have those processes in place in Russia, when uh, people subjugated by Russian empire after its defeat in the war against Ukraine will raise, those processes will be inevitable. And those who are in power today or those who will be in power tomorrow won't make use of this nuclear potential during internal conflict. So the war between Russia and Ukraine is an aggression by Russia, and Russia must be held responsible for those crimes. And political processes which uh, will take place in Russia, inside Russia, well, we can be sure that, well, he won't uh, uh, make use of a nuclear bomb to bomb Voronezh or Kuban. So we shouldn't be afraid of it. We shouldn't stop discussing what uh, have to, has to happen in Russia. Our friend from Austria uh, was right to say that uh, other countries became independent and uh, Russia's, Russians are responsible of the current situation. So they uh, must be interested uh, in a normal country. They want to live in a normal country without a nuclear arsenal. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ilya Ponomarev, uh, Congress of People's Deputies. I have a question uh, to Honorable Fillinger. Uh, sorry, we now we're talking mostly with you because uh, you had such a great speech uh, just, uh, just delivered to us. Uh, in the middle of February, there would be a, a, a meeting of OSCE in Vienna. Austria right now is the only country which still allows Putin's pundits to be issued visas and coming to participate in international con congresses. Uh, I am wondering what kind of security and cooperation we are talking about with representatives of uh, Putin's government and Putin's parliament. And maybe it would be a right idea with members of European Parliament from Austria, national parliament of Austria, to create a real event with normal Russian people which truly represent Russian people and not Putin's government at the same dates when uh, would be OCE meeting. Thank you. Thanks a lot for this information. I didn't know that, but I know, of course, that the Austrian government and the Austrian politics is heavily influenced uh, by Russia. And, you know, we have a big, big uh, problem in Europe with uh, energy business and uh, the corruption attached. When I lived in Ukraine, I learned that, that basically 1% of the um, revenues which one country delivers to Russia will be used for political corruption in that country. Uh? And then I try to understand my own country better. <laughs> and that's basically how it happens, because Austria, since 50 years, is the hub of Russian gas influence uh, in Europe. And we have started with this pipeline in the year 68, and that's why Putin came to the 50-year celebration. He concluded another contract uh, to 40 years uh, long for 7 billion to buy, um, we have to buy basically, um, Russian gas from him. So this is basically how it works. 1% of 7 billion, you can buy a lot of Austrian politicians and you can ensure that they then know that they have this obligation to be very nice for you, even when you launch a war of aggression, and then Austria has just very much minimal compliance with the sanctions and has been just, you know, to be on both sides, basically. And, but they have not really done anything courageous like the Czech Republic or others uh, who have really sent a lot of diplomats home, Austria just a few, and to, to learn that now uh, the representatives of Russia come back. I was so shocked. It was my most shocking experience in politics. In 2014, Putin has already attacked Ukraine, uh, Crimea and waged a war. And still in June, he was invited as a state guest to Austria. <laughs> and he was the red carpet and the Austrians said, oh, you're, you're such a great uh, gentleman. It was the visit of shame. 
in 2014 and in 18 again. So I apologize for the Austrian government. I don't represent it. I will fight on my social media activities and in the media against this visit. And yes, uh, event in Austria on that occasion with uh, the real representative of uh, the Russian nations would be very, very good. And I will work with Oleg uh, together on this one. And please, my deepest ideologies, there will be a new Austria. There will be a European Austria, which will be also purged from this Russian influence. It will emerge out of this uh, crisis and the transformation and exactly that's why I invite uh, everybody to support the NATO campaign because this neutrality is always leading that we want to build a bridge, dance with Putin on weddings and all these things which you might remember which I'm really apologizing and I'm ashamed for. Thank you very much and our Ukrainian friend. Um, hello everyone, uh, NGO Promote Ukraine. Uh, my name is Vasil Kushmas. Uh, first of all, I uh, want to be maximum grateful for uh, um, members of European Parliament uh, that you host uh, these brave people here and uh, give the, uh, that their voice will hear it in the Europe. Um, so first of all, I want to reply to those who not yet done uh, some things which I think very important because uh, I hear he, uh, that many of our representatives said that when Ukraine win, we take uh, uh, power in our hands, etc. Uh, so I think that uh, it will be fair if uh, you create national battalions of your representative as a part of the Ukrainian armed forces and send them to fight on the side of Ukraine. Because if you all say when Ukraine will win. Uh, so it means that Ukrainians sh uh, should to shed the blood uh, for you, but it's ready you to shed your blood for Ukrainians. Uh, and it's very important. I think that I know that many, for example, like a um, each area or um, uh, region of um, 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 I'm sorry, forget uh, your, your uh, Bashkiria, yes. So I think that uh, some of you already done it, but uh, very important that all of you did uh, do, do it. Um, so my question is logical how I think. So uh, who will legal successor of Russian Federation? Because for me, important to understand who will pay reparation for Ukraine. Thank you. Well, yes, it's a, also a very good question, but uh, I'm afraid uh, we are not able now uh, to, to answer this question, but this question should, uh, uh, should be, we should have it uh, before eyes. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, we should end this uh, part of the conference, uh, but uh, we we have time uh, uh, in this afternoon and, uh, and uh, evening, so we will meet together uh, again. Well, uh, and some sentences to the end. Well, the, the souls and then the dictators of the Soviet Union and then uh, President Putin, they wanted Europe and uh, United States, the world, to see the Russia, uh, Rus Russian Empire, Russia, as a monolith. And the picture drawn today at this conference shows that it was not, it was, and it is not true. Um, there is a variety of uh, countries, of lands, uh, in Russia, so it uh, opens new perspectives uh, after the war. And to the end, Slava Ukraini. Thank you very much. Hello.